Okay, and we're recording. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the Grateful Nation, you are seeing me in a new place right now. That's right, new studio. I'm very excited to announce that we're going to be doing weekly shows now. It's not one of those, you know, two weeks, when are we gonna see Mike, when are the new episode, whatever. New episode every Wednesday. And if you're watching this now, that means that it's Wednesday. And thank you for tuning in because today we have a very interesting guest. Uh, his name is Tim Whitaker. And he is the creator, I guess, of the Instagram feed, the Instagram profile, the Instagram, I don't know what else could you call it, curated uh, materials of at new evangelical. No, it's not. Hold on. There he is. Hey. <laughs> hey, Tim. Hi. Let's go wide. Hey, Tim, how you doing? I'm good, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's It's very cool to talk to you. Thank you very much. So if you see me, that is the viewing audience looking down, it's because I'm looking at my laptop. Obviously, I don't have a computer mounted camera. So Tim's looking right at the camera, looking right at you. <laughs> I'm looking down at the computer to look at Tim. But when I'm talking to the audience, I'm looking right at you guys. But now that I'm gonna be talking to Tim. So Tim, I found you because I saw a post of yours, uh, which was um, lovingly shown on my explore feed. And I guess I clicked it and I was like, well, what is this stuff? <laughs> um, and I think our viewers wanted blood. They were like, Mike, you got to press them on all these things. Uh, th th a lot of this stuff is nonsense. Most of this stuff is nonsense. 99.5% <laughs> of this stuff is nonsense. And I was like, yeah, maybe. But um, I'm interviewing Jimmy Dore in May. A lot of our fans know this. And what I would like to do for the future of this show is to talk to people who don't necessarily agree with me about everything, because as you know, it gets boring. You know, that it doesn't make life as spicy. You wanna to talk to people who don't agree with you. So yeah. Tim, thank you for coming on. And you know what, I'll allow you for a moment to... Uh... Oh. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, where, where you are in the world, you don't dox yourself or anything like that. But uh, give us a little bit of background about you and why you started the uh, New Evangelicals. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, again, thanks for having me. Yeah, my name is Tim Whitaker. I live in New Jersey. I'm on the East Coast. Um, my background is conservative Protestant evangelicalism. So not Catholic. In fact, I was taught that Catholics probably weren't real Christians growing up, to be transparent with you. Uh, yeah, so that, that was that was a thing that I grew up believing for a long time, um, but always saw myself as someone committed to Jesus, at least the one I was introduced to, um, and and made um, evangelicalism really my life. I, I became a drummer very early on, still played to this day professionally. Um, so I got kind of sucked into like more of the modern worship music, and I was always really curious about theology and just understanding when we talk about God, what are we talking about? What does the Bible have to say about certain things? Um, and so I was, I was that kid, you know, in evangelical circles, I was one of these golden childs or children. Um, you know, I saved myself for marriage. I was always at church. I had, I was part of the youth group. I was on leadership. I did parachurch evangelical things. I was at CU at the pole. Um, you know, everything that like my culture taught me, these are the marks of a good Christian, uh, is what I did. And I, I believed it. I, I wasn't faking it. I wasn't someone different um, at home or with, with other friends. I was homeschooled for nine years, went to a small private school after that. So that was my whole life. And um, through different twists and turns, as I took my faith more and more seriously, I just found myself increasingly at odds with uh, conservative um, evangelical theology and perspectives, or I should say I had more questions. Um, so, for example, you know, I grew up Calvinist, uh, which essentially means that God is predetermining all things, uh, including who is in and who is out regarding salvation. And always had questions about that, but was always kind of told that, you know, well, God's good and whoever he predestines, he predestines. You know, as you get older and you have friends who maybe aren't Christian or you have a, a brother who isn't Christian, and the only answer is, well, God just determined it to be that way. You start having more of those kinds of questions. So mm -hmm. that was kind of my exploration. You know, like, okay, is there is there other ways of viewing these kinds of topics? Heaven, hell, the afterlife. What is the Bible? How do we get the Bible? I was always a curious kid. I, I just wanted to know um, truth. You know, I, I, I wanted to be as, as open and honest about, about my faith as possible. And I think kind of skipping a lot, in 2016, when Trump came on the scene, um, I was really perplexed by the tradition that I grew up in really embracing him as, as a God fearing, you know, you must vote for this person candidate because the story I tell people is, you know, when you grow up in, uh, 
when you grow up with, with, with a very strict sexual ethic, right, and you're told that, that that good people, people with integrity and honor, they live by this sexual ethic, and you do that, and then the same people who raise you on this sexual ethic are telling you, no, 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 you should vote for the guy on the cover of Playboy magazine and the guy who brags on a hot mic about sexually assaulting women and who's on his third marriage and you know paying off porn stars and lying about it. These are all, you know, we need a commander in chief, not a pastor in chief. I just never bought it because it just, it conflicted with the values that they taught me. So that kind of put me on a path of like, you know, something, something doesn't smell right in my own tradition. I have questions. I'm not getting really great answers. And then um, we had, you know, the, the uh, Black Lives Matter happened and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. And I started really, I started really rethinking, like, why is this happening and what's going on? And then COVID happened. I wasn't thrilled by by my church's response, like in general. Um, you know, there was a guy named Sean Foyt. I'm not sure if your listeners know who he is, but uh, in the middle of the pandemic, he's doing these like worship protests with no masks, saying this is tyranny. And I'm thinking, well, I, and I was still pretty conservative regarding my theology and even my my political stances, but I thought it doesn't make a lot of sense that wearing a mask during a pandemic when we're not sure of how this thing spreads or how deadly it is, why that would be tyranny. It sounds like we're just loving our neighbor and being extra cautious. So all those things eventually, you know, kind of grew. And then I, I had the thought one day, like, you know, we need a new evangelical movement. Something isn't right here. And that kind of put me on the path that I'm on today. Now we're a nonprofit organization doing all kinds of content, podcasts, everything. And this is the work that I do. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, so a couple of things. Let's get the side by side here of you because we're about to go CNN arguing with each other, talking heads. Not really though. Um, <laughs> I want, yeah, I wanted to say that uh, I agree for the most part. Now, for the most part, if you want to get into like syntax and just the way that words were used, as far as like Trump uh, doing the whole uh, Billy Bush hot mic thing, we disagree there. But I, I was within the last year, I was definitely more perplexed on why very religious people would support someone like Trump. And I guess I, I've been I've been told this numerous amount of times. Hey, you know, well, he's the lesser of two evils. And to that I've always thought, if I'm if I'm brought a choice between two evils, regardless if one is lesser or more, the right choice is to choose neither. When presented with evils, you choose neither. It doesn't doesn't matter if one's lesser or more, they're both evil, right? And I'm not saying that Trump's evil. I'm not saying that Biden's evil. Right. Biden might just, you know, Biden's just not there. I feel bad for the guy. But that's one of the things that I've always thought about, especially uh, getting back into my Catholic faith. I'm saying, I don't, like, because does Trump, I, I don't even know if Trump really calls himself an evangelical. Like, I don't, I don't know. I know he has a very large support group amongst evangelical Christians. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't think so much with Catholics. Um, and I mean, I would, that, that's, that's a totally different conversation because hmm. the, the modern Catholic, the majority of them are probably not real Catholics. You have people like Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, who really shouldn't be partaking in any of the sacraments. I personally think that they should be excommunicated hmm. uh, just for a lot of their own um, religious that religious beliefs that coincide with their political beliefs. But yeah, that's hmm. something that I see now that, even if Trump's the nominee, I don't think I can vote for him um, as a Catholic. And I think probably a lot of Catholics are probably scared to say something like that. Hmm. Um, so that's tough. So you were you were saying that you were even at one point politically conservative or were you just more yeah. religiously conservative? No, I mean, I, when you grow up with evangelicalism, you grow up they're, they're They kind of come as a package deal. You know, you're just kind of taught that 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 the way you vote, what you listen to. I mean, I grew up on a steady diet of talk radio. Sean Hannity, okay. Rush Limbaugh, Mark Levin. I can name them all. I listened to them steady because my dad owned his own construction business. So my okay. field trips sometimes were going to work with him, helping him paint or do this or that. And he would have that on the radio all day. So I grew up you know, completely entrenched. In, in conservative politics and you know was always taught you, you vote republican although i will say to be fair i agree with you mike on that lesser of two evils approach mostly uh and i voted third party in 2016 it was the first time and only time in my life i ever did that because i couldn't bring myself to vote for either candidate uh, but yeah, yeah as, as far as my, my politics i mean they, they've shifted a lot i think over the past couple of years but i definitely grew up uh incredibly conservative and, and believed it uh for a long time 
Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think I did vote for Trump in 2016. Uh, I wasn't a practicing Catholic then, so I guess it was per permissible. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, uh, between 2016 and 2020, I voted for a lot of libertarians in uh, local elections and, sure. um, you know, uh, state Senate elections and stuff like that, which I do. You know, I kind of regret doing that because I found uh, libertarians to be incredibly, uh, what's the word? I guess kind of like jellyfish, you know, they're really no backbone. It's kind of like, Hey, whatever, yeah. man, it doesn't yeah. hurt any, but whatever. Um, yeah. but, but yeah, so now I'd like to consider myself a Christo fascist, I think. And, and it's one of the things that we can talk about because you did talk about uh, Christian nationalism, but I don't want to, uh, go there just yet. Sure. Um, so if you can help me understand something just so that the audience who maybe doesn't know the term evangelical, yeah. Now we know that that we know that that um, encompasses Protestantism, right? Yes. But does evangel evangelical is not a denomination, right? Evangelical is just. Can you help me understand what that means? Yeah. So let me just be very transparent. Um, this is an incredibly hard term to define. A a any scholar who studies this stuff will tell you it it's not like a here it is one sentence. And the reason why is because the history of evangelicalism has always been in tension. There's always been groups trying to kind of claim the title for themselves and the boundaries kind of shifted. So right now, my understanding, and I am drawing off of some scholarship here, like um, like uh, Constantine Campbell and uh, Isaac Sharp. I just wrote a book about this, actually. Um, but the term evangelical is less and less a theological paradigm and more and more becoming a political paradigm. Um, it wasn't always that way. It kind of shifted from like a, a, a fundamentalist view of Protestant thought. And then it kind of got in bed with, with right wing politics. And then it kind of took over kind of the label. I mean, for example, there's actually an article on this that 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 I think it's Pew Research has found that there are some, not a lot. I don't want to overstate my case, but there are even some um some uh, Muslims who would who use the evangelical identity uh, uh to to define like how they were voting or 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 what kind of people group they put themselves in. So there is mm. evidence I think that the term evangelical is becoming more and more about political affiliation than theological boundary. Um and this might be a, a deeper cut for your audience, but in the Protestant world, there are kind of two two extremes that I give people to kind of show how they're they're actually united, uh, not through theology. So there's someone like uh, Kenneth Copeland, who is what they call a prosperity gospel preacher. Someone you know would tell yes, you yes, to I plant the seed mm -hmm. and you know and, and 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 give me your money and God will bless you. And most people in in evangelical spaces, besides people who like Kenneth Copeland, don't really see him as like a legitimate Christian in that sense. On mm -hmm. the other side of the spectrum, you have someone named James White. He's much more what they call reformed, much more um, conservative in his theology, uh, more, more Calvinist. They don't agree at all theologically, but they have the same exact political views. And I've never seen James White, who likes to be one of these heresy hunters, ever call out Kenneth Copeland. Uh, so, okay. so, so what unites them is, is their take on COVID, their take on whatever it would be. So I noticed this kind of shift from people who maybe five years ago would be like, no, they're a heretic. No, they're a heretic. Now they're kind of quiet and they're kind of sharing the same political views. So even yeah. I've seen this, this shift in my own personal experience. Okay. Oh, interesting. And yeah, just, just to give you kind of like a little bit of uh, not necessarily data, but just kind of what our audience looks like our audience for the most part, I would say is, you know, very overwhelmingly Christian. Now, when it comes down to it, we've had, I think at this point now we've had more Catholic guests than we've had Protestants, but we've had Dr. Michael Easley on. I had Stuart and Cliff Nettle who are connectly, who I think, who I think are absolutely awesome. Um, and then we had on uh doctor for Christopher Yuan. Um, who studied under Dr. Michael Easley at Moody Bible College. But we've had on um, my, my buddy Brian, who runs Catholicism. We've had on great Gabriel St. George. And then we had on uh, my buddy uh, Franco Aurelio. And um, we have some other really cool Catholics coming on. But I think I make memes where it's, you know, the Catholics versus the Protestants <laughs> and some of the Orthodox are just standing by and watching and laughing. Yeah. Um, so that's basically, you know, how, how our audience is made up. So there are probably a lot of people who actually know who you're referencing and who you're talking about. Um, here's something that you said earlier with the, the, with the take on COVID. Do you ever find it troubling to see, I know in places like Canada, I know places in Europe, where police would barge inside of churches and arrest pastors and arrest priests because they, they've done it a lot in Europe. Um, did, did that ever bother you? Like saying, okay, I think they might be taking this a little bit too far, especially given the uh, 
you know, the right to assemble and the freedom of religious expression in this country specifically, did that ever bother you? Like, I, I don't know if these guys are, I don't know if the government's maybe taking it a little bit too far. What, what well, were your I, thoughts on that as it was happening and yeah. a, as you see it today? Well, I, I think, are you referencing maybe James Coates up in Canada? He was, he was one of the big names of a pastor who, um, you know, yes. I think, yeah, got arrested up there. I, I, I'm not aware, and maybe you are, uh, Mike, I'm not aware of any pastor getting arrested in the U.S., um, but yeah, in, in, in regards, uh, to Canada, you know, the story about James Coates is actually quite simple. Um, it was, at least, at least from my vantage point, And I, I, I want to say I did a pretty good job reading into this and trying to get all the data. I follow the story pretty closely, but essentially it's the middle of a pandemic. There are health restrictions and social distancing mandates in place. Okay. Not the first time, by the way, in human or U S or world history. This is normally how we deal with pandemics. In fact, Martin Luther, when the bubonic plague was going around, pretty much said the same exact thing in his own language. Um, and James Coates pretty much, you know, gave the middle finger to the government. said we're not going to submit to your restrictions because of whatever political or whatever view I have of COVID. The government gave him a lot of options not to do that. Then they fined him. Then he didn't pay the fine. And then after all of that, they arrested him. So I think that what I, the narrative I heard from people, I'm thinking of someone named Costi Hinn, who really, who was kind of one of the big proponents of, of, of this story is that, oh my God, look, the government's just kicking down random churches and arresting people. But that's not really the case. I mean, one example I think of is, you know, in the US, we have fire code laws. And if you don't pass fire code tests and you start gathering people and you don't pay the fines, you'll get arrested. So I didn't see it as all as, as like what some people saw it as uh, personally. That, that That's just my honest take on the situation regarding James Coates in particular. I'm not right, sure about right, right. I think what, what bothered me the most was, were the, the responses and the actions of funerals in church, like in church, that really kind of pissed me off where they limited people's, they limited families getting together and um, grieving, especially during funerals. I, I mean, we've seen like, you know, tons of yeah. viral videos where, you know, people are sitting six feet apart. I don't know if you've ever seen that video where the one son kind of goes up to put his arm around his grieving mother and the police are literally there and they have to separate them um, from hugging or whatever. Yeah. Um, and this, this is something tough because I can't reflect on it personally, because again, I wasn't a practicing Catholic in 2020, mm. but I know there was a church that I went out to visit in uh, Los Angeles when I was there, I guess last, late last year in December. And they were still, I, I don't know if they were, they were still practiced outside. I think there was some COVID regulation where you weren't allowed to be indoors. So they had to be outside in the tent. Um, and I just remember that particular day it was very wet raining. It just happened to be the one day that it rained in LA in like the last three months. And mm. I just remember saying, I, I remember asking like, why are you, why are you guys outside? You know, how come you guys aren't inside the church? Yeah. They said, Oh, it's a COVID restriction. I see yeah. that. That sounds a little ridiculous. Although it might be a little bit more comfortable in California. Um, well, to be fair. I think what um, really got, oh God. Yeah. Sorry. I want to catch go you. ahead. No, no, no. Go I ahead. was going to say, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, uh, like the government, uh, always made the right decisions regarding like how to enforce certain, you know, COVID restrictions or, or social distancing laws. And I do think when it comes to funerals, like I, I get all that a hundred percent. I think the reason why I get so skittish is because I watch a lot of bad faith actors take certain examples to try and make it seem like, like this whole thing was planned. Uh, people were calling it a pandemic to try and, 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 and have total government control, which is just, I mean, here we are in 2023, all those restrictions, at least in my area. And I think in the U S are pretty much lifted. So I think that mm -hmm. it just kind of tells, it tells the story of, well, I don't think it was nefarious. I think that people were doing the best they could with the information that they had. And I fully can have no problem saying like, yeah, maybe there were some things that were a little over the top, but that's different than the perspective of this is just government taking over, trying to control the Christians, trying to persecute us. Very different perspectives, even if we could agree that some of the restrictions yeah. might have been over the top. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it was a direct targeting of, of Christians at all. You know, that COVID-19 was the direct car targeting of Christians and their, uh, and their ability to uh, practice their religion freely. I don't, I think that would be a bit of a reach though. Um, though COVID yeah, and our health is something that I wanted to talk about um, because it, it directly relates to a post that I saw of yours. And, and mm. this is probably going to be um, probably where we disagree the most maybe, but mm. you had made a post that was saying uh, something about, now, when you say conservative, 
Yeah. When, when I hear you saying conservative, I think you mean like conservative people. But when you're saying conservative in your post, do you mean conservative evangelicals? Are you, Who are you specifically talking about? Because I'm going to talk about the post where you talked about this, quote unquote, obsession with trans people. Oh, yeah. I, I was really targeting. And, and by the way, that's a very fair question, I think, to ask. Um, I was I'm mostly targeting people in my faith tradition who would be like I I. I use the term conservative. I, I prefer the term these days for the people I'm talking about to be more far right um, than conservative because I know conservatives who, who are not this way. But I was mostly talking about evangelicals, the far right media, Charlie Kirk, Turning Point, that kind of group of people in particular. Okay. Okay. So 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 conservatives who are both political and um, evangelical in a way, right? Like kind of like yeah, I, I, in my head, I, had, I mean, like, Charlie not, Kirk is, is an evangelical Christian. Yes, he is. Yeah, he's not. He's not Catholic or Orthodox. Or no, right. Like but that, Matt so. Walsh, I guess, okay. is Matt Walsh Catholic? Do you see him as Catholic? I don't know. I he's I think ca- he, he's Catholic, but he rarely talks about it. Right. So and yeah, okay, yeah. So right, I had yeah. the, I had those types yeah. of people in my head when I was making the video. Okay, so. You said, uh, give me a little, cause I don't want to, I don't want to play the video cause I have it up. I just have some notes here. The, the obsession with trans people. And you said we shouldn't be necessarily obsessed with the trans issue because there are other, um, there are other things, other policy points that we should probably be focusing on, whether it's poverty, homelessness, healthcare, right? So, stuff like that. Like why yeah. are conservatives, uh, focusing so hard on the trans, on the trans, um, on either trans people or on the trans agenda, I would say. Sure. Um, sure. Mm-hmm. And I guess what I want, what I wanted to say is, living in Tennessee, obviously, you know that if you've been paying attention, we have a bill ends minors from attending. Mike, I'm so sorry. You keep on breaking up. It's, shows. I, I, and I there was also like a bill that mount uh, surgeries and. Oh, really? Yeah. Let me yeah. see here because it says times. that the Wi Fi connection is good. Same Try- on my end. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I just have a, I, yeah, my router's okay. pretty new. I've got no problems. I wonder if I can plug, how would I plug into the router? Uh, with Ethernet? You can plug Ethernet into the router. router. Not in my laptop. Hmm. Hmm. I guess we'll just have to deal with it. Sorry, no everybody, if you're watching it. It says it says it says that the um it says that the connection's okay. Okay. Um, and I'm uh, all right. But um yeah, sorry about that. So okay, what didn't you hear? I heard up until I think something about uh, banning drag queen shows, maybe. Yeah. So in Tennessee, I'm sure that you've heard that we've had uh, minors are legally banned from um from attending drag shows. Okay. Yep, that and uh, there's that the, the, uh, new legislation that Mal- Matt Walsh helped introduce, where I believe minors are also barred from receiving gender affirmation, either surgery or any sort of uh, medical assistance in up into a certain age. I think. Mm-hmm. I think I don't know the laws off the top of my head. Sure. Um, but what I what I, what I wanted to say was, I feel like the reasons why conservative versus conservatives are so obsessed with it is because. They feel, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking maybe for them and for myself as well, I feel, and they feel, it's probably shoved in our face more than should be necessary. Like we see it in every facet of our lives right now. So we see it in entertainment, we see it in sport, and we see it in politics. And like you, I agree that there are definitely a lot of other issues which probably take precedent. Now, a lot of people might not like when I say that because... I've been saying lately, listen, one of the ways that, you know, the, 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 the conversations about transgenderism, the conversations about, you know, uh, young children wanting to transition or having problems with their gen- gender identities is to stop talking about it, to stop shining a light on it. That's really the only way that it's going to stop. But I think what conservatives do is they like to pour this gasoline on fires that only help to bring it more into the spotlight, which to some liberals or to some progressive is exactly what, you know, they want to happen because they want to keep on talking about these things. But myself personally, I just feel like I tend not to necessarily talk about it. I tend not to necessarily care. And a lot of people in my circle will say things like, well, Mike, if you don't talk about it, if you don't address it, these things are just going to get worse. You're going to have four-year-olds now who are going to be able to go onto the operating table. And I'm saying, well, you got to vote for the, you got to vote for better people. 
because right now conservatives aren't really conservatives, politicians anyway. Pundits will be able to say whatever they want, but they won't really affect policy. But what I like to say though is that when you talk about the other things like let's talk let's talk about affordable health care and things like that. There's something that I want to talk to Jimmy Dory about where affordable health care, universal health care, or free health care, however you want to describe it, it sounds like a good thing and it sounds like something that I would kind of get behind if the government was somewhat competent. If the government had our health in its best interest, then I might prescribe to something like that. But when I see the government kind of handing out uh, hamburgers and hot dogs and French fries in order to get the COVID vaccine and not necessarily, you know, care how we live the other 364 days of the year when they're not trying to sell us some vaccine that they're making a ton of money off of and that we're, you know, paying the taxes on. That's where I'm like, I don't even really want to talk about healthcare. With poverty, hmm. as a Catholic, there are plenty of there are plenty of charities that I donate to that the Catholic community as a whole that does a lot of good work that I think um, I would like to see more take place in the public sphere and even in the like private sector sphere as far as uh, businesses go. I think Catholics run really great charities. Um, and, and you also talked about the wealth gap and pollution. Um, pollution, I, but he, here's the thing. I'm kind of, uh, not that I'm ignorant on the subject of, let's say, global warming or pollution, but I agree that pollution is a bad thing. Nobody wants to pollute. I don't want to see, uh, what are they called? Landfills just, you know, littered with garbage and plastics that get into our oceans and things like that. And I, I don't want to hear about Greta Thunberg talking about these things anymore when she's just really, uh, she's really a, a, a kind of like a sad pawn, like she's getting used and people don't talk about really interesting people who are doing really good things for the environment. Someone like Boyan Slot, who's actively cleaning up the ocean floor and getting rid of plastics. Um, I, I, so what do you think? Do you think that the trans agenda should be at the same level as let's say like the wealth gap or is poverty more important than that? What do you think? Well, I mean, I wouldn't call it personally a trans agenda. Um, you know, I think so trans people. So, so the yeah, person was I like, mean, why trans, are you yeah. so obsessed with trans people? I mean, I, I got to be honest with you, Mike, and I, I'm just being transparent. I, I, I don't watch TV all the time. Most of my when, when, when I have free time, I usually watch The Office. <laughs> so the shows I watch sure. are like 10 years old. But, you know, like I'm not aware of anyone bringing all this attention to trans people besides far right media. I mean, I, I, the only people I, I see who are always talking about the trans agenda or trans ideology or whatever they think it is, is usually the pundits that I get paid to follow and, and see what they're talking about. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, statistically, trans people are like, I think at the most, maybe 4% of the US population. Um, and frankly, like, I'm like, uh, why all the focus on a people group who already is a is a fringe minority, uh, who's all in all that I'm aware that they're asking for is just to be recognized in society as people. Um, and yet we can't seem to solve the poverty gap. I mean, listen, I, I will say this. I'm all about it's, it's a very interesting thing. I think, well, let me let me just say that you brought up that statistic about 4%. And it's very interesting because really, why is this very, very, very small minority of people getting so much attention? It, it, it's a very curious thing. But I think as far as like, let's, like I said, with sports, entertainment and politics, there, there seems to be something I would like to say nefarious going on where this small group of people, for whatever reason, is having this big push to push that ideology onto, let's say, a maybe, I don't want to say non-welcoming, but almost like a kind of ignorant public who I don't think generally would care anyway. But when you say you don't watch a lot of TV, I, you, you, have a, you have a small child, right? I have two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have, I have a, I have a, I have a toddler and I've Same. noticed this in a, <laughs> right. I've noticed this in a lot of the programming, whether it be on Disney or PBS, a lot of this stuff is talked about and it's talked about delicately because they want to talk to kids about it, but it's, but it, it's, it's everywhere. It's especially um, invasive on social media where a lot of these large accounts who let's say if um, you know, if I see a political pundit that I like, there's just, there's an account that is just as big talking about uh, all these different trans issues. There's sports, there's entertainment, there's movies, there's politicians that for whatever reason want to elevate this minority. Um, now, for, for whatever reasons they're doing that for, it's very interesting. I think a lot of it is money. I think a lot of it has to do with money. When you heard what? about when Matt yeah. Walsh, 
when yeah. Matt Walsh did expose Vanderbilt University, he showed a video about how this one woman, I don't know if she was an administrator or if she was a doctor, but she when she was talking about how long someone who would be receiving gender affirming care, whether they came in as let's say like a 10 year old uh, boy who wanted to transition, who had to be evaluated psychologically and then possibly could be attended to medically. Mm -hmm. She was saying that something like, oh, we'd have a patient for the next 10 years and thus be able to make this amount of money off that person. I think that there might be a bigger uh, money incentive behind these issues than let's say, I don't want to say a social one, but I, th I, I don't know. I think that's where it is because you see even Fortune 500 companies are getting behind uh, I'll call it an agenda, but the trans agenda, uh, the fashion industry is doing the same thing. And I think, I think it's all a money grab. They see a very tiny minority of people who on social media have a very, very large voice. They want to elevate that and they want to make money. They want to help their bottom line. Yeah. So I think a lot of things are true at the same time. Number one, do you think that, that I, I know what video you're talking about with the healthcare provider, doesn't that just prove that the healthcare system we have now as a for-profit entity should not be what it is because it gives the wrong incentives. Doesn't that kind of prove the point that we need affordable health care? I agree. In this I agree. And if it's 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 something but, that we but, talk but about earlier, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to push you on this just for a minute, it, you know, respectfully. But you mentioned yeah. how you know you don't really trust the government running health care, but you also can see that that for profit health care has bad incentives. So, like, what's the solution then for you? I don't know that, that here okay. and and that, fair, fair. That's, that's, I'm just curious. That's I, I really don't know, and I'm not going to yeah. pretend like I have I have this answer. Sure. But when I see things like that with with Vanderbilt specifically, because they're a private institution, they're not state run, they're not government run. They might have a little bit of government funding depending on what they're doing or what they're requesting funding yeah. for. And then when right. I see like let's say I see the people who have made vaccines, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, um, what was the other one? I can't remember Johnson and Johnson. Johnson, Johnson. But when I see these companies. Being making so much money off of the backs of its people, where you know there there have been plenty of studies to show that you know I think I think I heard this statistic or I either heard it or read it. I can't remember if I was listening to someone or I read it, but that seven something percent of COVID deaths could have been prevented if the people who died had better vitamin D levels. And either through supplement or, you know, just direct exposure to sunlight. And the fact that like yeah. we, we live in this society now where our health isn't, you know, you know, something that is, that is talked about all the time by our government. I mean, we don't, we don't really hear it. The, 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 the thing that we'll hear the most is like, oh, we're going to change public school lunches and, you know, Michelle Obama. And now look, uh, instead of French fries, we make carrots, but okay, that's great. But still like you aren't talking, you aren't giving people an incentive to trust you when you want to take over the healthcare business. And the same thing with private insurance companies, private insurance companies, private healthcare, like it's all a mess. So I don't really I, know the best way to fix a lot of these things. Well, I feel like, I mean, it's funny you bring up the Michelle Obama thing. I, I was going to mention that actually, because I, I mean, as long as I can remember, I actually, I remember specifically Glenn Beck mocking Michelle and Barack Obama for trying to push healthy eating to children. And then they, they twisted it as a form of like state control. So then they advocate for freedom of conscience and then people get fast food in their veins and that taxes the healthcare system. And then we're yeah. told, oh, the you know, they no one cares about you. It's like, okay, I, I hear what you're <laughs> saying. I and mean, what I'm trying right. to say is like I feel like there's it's a it's a I feel like it's a it's a no win situation for folks who have these perspectives of like the government's bad, but also a uh, big pharma is sucking up money. Like, yeah, I agree. I mean, big, we've known for all, and I've, I've personally, I've thought this for a, a long time before COVID ever happened. Like, wow, big pharma has a great incentive to keep people sick. Like for sure. But when you brought that yes. up, at least in my circles, by conservative pundits, they would mock you as being big government and not free market. And then they completely change the rhetoric to, oh my yeah. gosh, big pharma in the vaccine. So I don't think, from my vantage point, I don't see a lot of integrity with the with the perspectives from what people are saying now because I'm old enough to remember when when they were saying the complete opposite ten years ago. So I yeah, feel like, was, like yeah, they're more I, I opportunist that. than they actually are on principle of like no, we're advocating for this no matter what. Yeah, because because I'm with you. At the same time, yeah. I think what I was last thought on this, I'll hand it back over to you. What I would okay. say is you know a, when a pandemic happens, vaccines absolutely save lives they've been tested for a long time they've eradicated polio and so i, I i'm not i understand 
that yes, big pharma made a lot of money on vaccines. I also understand that, we're, that we were in a global pandemic that killed over 3 million people in the US. That being said, we can yeah. walk and chew gum at the same time. I'm all about finding ways to make prescription drugs and, and life-saving care for people actually affordable. I have a friend who's a diabetic. When he lost his health care because he he works with me doing music on the weekends, which is a, a like a contracting job, his insulin mm-hmm. was over $600 a month. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So certainly we can find better ways to make it affordable for people. Oh yeah, I think so too. And I think, I think you, you, and even, you know, you said this before when, you know, people will take fast food into their veins and it becomes taxing on the, um, on, you know, on healthcare and our, and our healthcare infrastructure. I agree with you. And that's probably one of the biggest problems that I had with COVID because a lot of the, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk about COVID too much just because, uh, sure, you know, sure. I feel the way I feel about it, but yeah. I feel like a lot of people died because they were just generally unhealthy. And, it, and, and, you know, this, the state of our health, the state of our diet for the past 80 years has dramatically changed. And, you know, people have just become more and more unhealthy, even with, you know, even with the government running it, even with private companies who, who are taking care of our insurance. So I'm trying to find, and, and just to be clear, I don't necessarily even call myself conservative anymore. So I do agree with you because I thought when Trump brought on, you know, the, the Johnson Johnson family at one of his uh, campaign stops, I was like, ugh. I was like, yeah. okay, even if I'm, you know, that if you want to call me the anti-vaxxers and who would probably make up a lot of Trump's base for him to then bring on the Johnson and Johnson family would kind of like a slap in their face. Um, but anyway, and let's not forget um, Johnson and Johnson uh, got sued for putting uh, what, what was what was in, in their talcum powder that was causing cancer, and they hid it for oh, decades. Um, not asbestos, but uh, something like that. You know, yeah. so I, I'm all Arsenic, about maybe, having. I think. Yeah, I'm all about having accountability and oversight my solution would be well i think that we need we have to have a referee in the game but i understand some people would say well we can't trust the government so that's when i get stuck too frankly you know so yeah no i get that and then you said um another thing that was a problem because you said uh affordable health care poverty the wealth gap uh pollution and then you said abusive pastors oh yeah. yeah so that that was that was interesting how big of a problem listen we all know we all know uh, the problems that the Catholic Church has had with uh, abusive priests. And to that, I've just always says, yes, uh, you know, gay priests are probably not a good idea, especially, you know, where they're able to prey on children to vulnerable populations. But how big of a problem are abusive pastors within the evangelical community? Um, I would say they're pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, I'm not going to come on your podcast and, and, and hold your feet to the fire when, when, I, when we can't critique our own. Uh, you know, and, and the reality is that you know, the problem with evangelicalism is that it's not structured at all like the Catholic Church where you have, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I will admit I'm, I'm, I'm a little ignorant here, but I mean, you have a very structured top-down There's approach, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. evangelicalism, as you know, is based on Protestantism, which is completely the opposite of that. So, so, so you have denominations, you have like networks, but this there's not the same kind of like hierarchical status that people have. Um, and depending on where you're looking, uh, there absolutely are problems. One of, one of the bigger high profile cases was, I think it was last year or two years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention, one of the biggest evangelical groups in in, in the US, uh, over 14 million members. You know, it turned out they were hiding uh, uh, sexual abuse cases for over a decade uh, by some of like their top leaders. It was a big freaking deal. Um, mm-hmm. And victims were coming forward trying to find justice and, and it was just hidden. And even to this day, there, there's one pastor in particular, he was named in the report, um, his, 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 the allegations against him were found to be credible um his name is johnny hunt and he's back preaching in pulpits and he's he's trying now to sue the sbc for that report so there's oh, not really? a lot of accountability or repentance frankly um by mm-hmm. a lot of these pastors so the work that we deal with is helping people who really have been maybe abused by evangelical churches or pastors trying to maybe kind of find faith again uh, away from such such a toxic system in that regard I remember I was talking to someone, I can't remember who it was, if we were maybe, I think it was with a guest and who was talking about maybe a girl that he knew, but someone that I think was probably a Protestant, probably an evangelical. And she said she left, she left the church. She's no longer a Christian. She's an atheist. And I think it was nothing to do with a pastor, maybe some abuse. And I ran to her, I said, well, well, why would you be an atheist? I mean, if, if the church, let's just say the quote unquote church, and when I say the church, that pastor uh, who embodies that church, if the church hurt, hurt you, you know, why would that ruin your relationship with God? Now, I understand because you you literally have someone who is representing God that is doing the hurting. So one might feel that 
you know, that's the person who's hurting me. But do you find that a lot with people who, who undergo abuse uh, by, let's say, pastors that they just leave the church entirely and they end up either becoming atheists or agnostic? Um, it, it definitely happens. You know, the people that we work with, they want to kind of find faith, right? So they, they, they're having more of a crisis of theology or maybe a crisis of experience than a crisis of faith. Um, mm. but yeah, I mean, that absolutely happens. And, and, you know, one of the critiques we get from people in our own circles is that, oh, well, you, you just trusted your pastor, not God. And, and, and to your point, we say, well, when people position themselves as spiritual authority figures and claim to be kind of speaking on behalf of the Bible or God's word, uh, and then they end up, you know, raping you. Uh, yeah, you think that's going to mess up how you view God? Like it's completely right. understandable. Uh, and so I, I have a lot of empathy for folks who are like, listen, man, I gave everything to the church and they sexually abused me or physically abused me. I go, I get why you want nothing to do with God, because that is a, you know, God is a very metaphysical concept that we're trying to think about. And people, especially in, re in religious circles who have authority are seen as kind of like some kind of physical embodiment of what God might be like either subconsciously or consciously. So it's very mm -hmm. understandable for me why folks would, would, would want nothing to do with their faith after they experience such trauma. And then there was no accountability. Right. That pastor right. still preaching. That pastor maybe was defended. Uh, so so I totally get it. Oh, interesting. You made a post about 35 weeks ago where you said oh, that. You're really um, digging. <laughs> I, no, I didn't go all the way back. I, I went back a little bit just because you have some you, your, your feed is, is really good. You make uh, posts stand out, especially the text one. Uh, but this one was the one where it was a video of you. And you said that uh, white evangelical evangelism uh, and Christian nationalism is directly responsible for the mess that we're in. And this was, you know, less than a year ago. What mess were you talking about? And what 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 are your um, thoughts on Christian nationalism? Oh, man, you know, I, I 35 weeks ago, less than a year ago, I, I'm not sure what the context of that video was, but I, I, I can kind of or that post was I. So let me let me see if there's another let me see if there's any text in the body of it. But OK, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of, of what it, I'm sure it was in relationship to something political. Um, uh, but Christian nationalism um, is nothing new. The language might be new, uh, but the ideology that undergirds it is not new at all. It's Christian supremacy. It's the idea that we have a divine mandate from God to rule over the nation that we occupy. This is this is not a new thought in Christendom anywhere. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Protestant. You can find streams of it almost anywhere. So that's what Christian nationalism is ultimately. And the way that it manifests in America primarily uh, is through evangelical spaces. Although I will say I'm discovering more and more Catholic traditions as well. I, and again, I don't I don't want to uh, overstep my bounds. But would you consider someone like like Nick Fuentes a Catholic? Because he had, identifies as Catholic. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. We've had, we've had him on the show uh, a couple of times. And, oh goodness, uh, you have. Yeah we've, yeah, we've had him on. We've had him on the show a couple times. Wow, and interesting. The, not that it's a problem, but what's interesting about Nick is he has just hours and 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 hours of public videos that anybody can go watch. And and what the problem is that a lot of people take let's say a sentence or two out of context. So if it's a racial, if, if they take this like weird uh, sort of um, hyperbolic or provocative thing he says about race, they take a sentence or two out and they leave out the bigger discussion uh, that was being had, or he's just honestly making a joke. Now, I, th I think, I think Nick is a, is, is a good Catholic and I'll stand by him and defend that um, just based on how he lives his life and his knowledge of scripture, his knowledge of Catholic history. And uh, I'll defend him and say, I think he's a good Catholic. If you present some evidence uh, to the contrary, where it's a quote, maybe out of context or something, then I would probably bite back on that. Um, but I think someone like Nick, and I know he's been working with uh, Ye or the artist formerly known as Kanye West. And I think that whole umbrella of Christian nationalism has uh, become a topic of discussion or a hotter topic of discussion and uh, by other politicians, even before Kanye, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who I'm not a big fan of at all. Um, but I, I think I wonder if evangelicals have a idea of what Christian nationalism looks like compared to a Catholic. And I think that they would oh, ultimately they definitely have to, do. right? <laughs> well, right. I mean, so, you know, I think, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I, go ahead. Would you identify as like a Catholic Christian nationalist since you, since you, you seem to be at least someone who respects the Fuentes? Here, but, but here's the thing. Uh, hold on. You cut out. You cut out. I don't even want to call myself a nationalist or even like it because I'll wait till you come back. Am I back? 
Uh, yes. Am I back? I think so. Okay. One this is brutally frustrating. Uh, no, but I, I heard your question. Would I consider myself a Christian or a Catholic nationalist? Um, no, it's okay. Yeah. Um, like I said before, Christo fascist and Christo fascist in the way that I think that I think Christ definitely needs to be the center point of our life. We obviously draw our morals from him and thus our laws. Um, but I think as far as Christian or Catholic nationalism, living in America and just kind of seeing the way that it's, I'll say, quote unquote, devolved, that obviously as a Catholic, we align ourselves with with the Vatican. Um, and I think that living in the U.S., is great because we get to we get to we get to practice our religion freely. Although Catholics have had a storied history within the United States, I know that they were banned from voting up until like the mid to late eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do I, I? I find myself kind of falling more out of love with the idea of America, and I don't know how to really verbalize that yet. But there's a little bit of disdain. There's a little bit of sadness but I identify myself more as a Catholic mm. without having that sort of nationalism, um, you know, marker thrown on that. Now, if it's in terms of, do I wish that we had laws that were, that were closely resembled to, let's say like a, um, uh, I don't know what kind of, what kind of Christo fascist government in the past. Uh, I think maybe Argentina was one of them or, uh, um, Spain maybe, like a Franco okay. kind of, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm sure, not too sure. well versed on that. There are a couple of other guests who we can have on that could speak better to that. Mm. But um, no, I probably wouldn't identify myself as like a Christian nationalist. I don't think. Well, I think it'll be very interesting because the Nick Fuentes who would be more than the Catholic Christian nationalist or whatever you want to call it, but you know, definitely yeah. uh, his Catholic faith drives him to have the political views that he has. I, I, one of the things that I've said often is like, you know, I can't wait for all of these fundamentalists to start arguing over who's the true Christians and, and who has the right version of, of, of this nationalism, because you have someone like Doug Wilson, who is much more of like the RJ Rush Dooney type of dominionism from the sixties, much more Protestant Presbyterian. Uh, yeah, he's yeah, arguing yeah, for his, Doug Wilson. All right. So yeah, yeah, yeah Doug Wilson. Then he got Sean Foyt. who's like a charismatic seven mountain mandate dominionist uh, with, with mm -hmm. all of his, you know, the Holy spirit and gifts of the spirit and, and charismatic movement. And you know, speaking in tongues, and then you have the Catholic nationalist. This I'm thinking is Steve Bannon. I think in more in those camps. I think he's Catholic, if I'm not mistaken. But again, I don't know for sure. That, that, that this is I, th the least I, I know think about. he's Catholic. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So I've kind of asked myself, like, well, what happens when like one of them gets power and the other two are like, no, you're not the real Christian? Because I, at least in my, I'm not sure how you see it. Because again, my lane is not so much Catholicism, but I will tell you right now, straight up, that Sean Foyt, Doug Wilson do not see Catholics as true Christians. I know that oh, they no, have I believe ministries that. Yeah. devoted to trying to convert Catholics to the true faith, which I must say, I, I, your last guest that you had, Gabriel St. Charles, I, I appreciated uh, what he said so much. Uh, regarding his critiques of Protestantism, because I agree with so many of them being like, they're all yeah. pointing at, at who has the right truth as they argue over all this stuff. So I think that personally, What's interesting uh, yeah, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, I'll let you finish your thought. No, you're fine. Yeah. Just my last thought is like, I, I for me, Christian nationalism, just to kind of answer your, your initial question a couple minutes ago, you know, it absolutely advocates for uh, this system that says we, as whatever Christian group it is, uh, have a divine right to rule over the nation and to enforce what we think are God are God's laws over the country, which which is it violates the First Amendment. It, it violates pluralism. It's anti democratic in nature. And so, for the sake of all of our neighbors, not just the Christian or Catholic ones, that's why folks like me resist that kind of ideology. Ah, oh, okay, gotcha. Um, I would say that. Um... Yeah, it is very interesting, and I can't. I really can't remember what I was going to say. I was just probably going to say something like, "Well, the Catholics would probably think that e the evangelicals or Protestants are, are wrong, <laughs> yeah. uh, which they, they they probably more likely are than not." Oh, I know what sure. I was going to say. The problem is also is that I don't think America has really actually had a Catholic leader. I mean, people will point to Joe Biden, not a Catholic. Like Joe Biden is not a Catholic. Uh, JFK also not a Catholic. You cannot be a Catholic and you have these public affairs and just kind of gallivant. And I don't want to say just because I don't like using that word. But he's he he was he was a uh, he was a philanderer. Let's just say. Um, so I don't think that's a representation of a true Catholic either. So I I think the problem is is that America really hasn't had any Catholic leader. Uh, Can I ask you far. a question about so that? Be, I'd be 
Sure. Would you mind? I'm because I, I I would like to learn something here personally. I I don't oh, know. Um, how? Okay, if if Catholicism is hierarchical, who decides who's a Catholic or not? Like, I know you think Joe Biden's not a Catholic, but if his priest mm. says no, he's a Catholic, do you have to submit to that priest's ruling and accept him as a brother in the Catholic tradition? How does that work for you? I think. I think, I mean, and th this would, this is just me talking like, like, again, I'm not a Catholic scholar. I'm probably not sure. the best representation of, you know, who Catholic is or what yeah. I would probably have to fall back on, you know, dogma and doctrine, uh, historically. And then also currently it, it, we would kind of have to pay attention to what the Pope says. Um, and the Pope, and this is recent, just as recent as 2023, I watched a, a really great documentary about the Pope on Hulu, where he talked to a group of young, uh, you know, younger people. And there was just a really, really diverse group of people, women, guys, non-binary people, all that kind of stuff. And he was consistent on things like um, gay marriage and abortion. And I think someone like Joe Biden, who openly, and Nancy Pelosi again, who openly pushed gay marriage and abortion, um, would go against that dogma and doctrine, thus would probably, not even probably, they should be excommunicated publicly. Like they should not be allowed to take sacrament. It's just something that, you know, if, if you're going to, let's say, uh, excommunicate a priest for, uh, you know, divulging, uh, um, you know, something in a confession, or you're going to, excommunicate a priest for for being schismatic or something like that i think that you would you would have to probably excommunicate the lay person or the lay catholic for for promoting and for um agreeing with things like let's say gay marriage or abortion um so yeah i i, I Okay. Yeah, I, I think I think that's what's kind of that's what's okay. And see, this is this is the problem with let's say the evangelicals that I, even I have. Sure. What what the structure that I like is the hierarchy. Okay. Mm. Let's see the dogma and the doctrine of the last two thousand years. Let's see what they have to say about abortion. Let's see what they have to say about homosexuality. Let's look at our past three popes and what they've said about it. Oh, okay. They all align. Oh, oh okay. Uh, you know, Pope Francis didn't actually say that homosexuality. Um, or, you know, a gay marriage is permissible in the Catholic church. They're just kind of trying to spin that. So it makes it seem like he is. Okay, sure. good, good. Now, the problem with you have with different Protestant pastors, evangelical pastors, is you'll have some that will say, no, abortion is wrong. They'll say something like, no, we will not marry gay people in this church. And then you will have other pastors who says, no, you know, we should support women in their choices to have abortions. And we should also be able to marry two people who are in love in the church in the eyes of God. And I think that's where probably a lot of that those problems lie because I mean, it's, it's starting to kind of happen, um, on a small scale, um, within Catholic leadership, especially in like the Synod, which is very weird. If you have a chance to look into the Synod, like look into that, it's, it's very okay. weird public messaging. Um, but yeah, I think that's where, cause I think you would agree knowing, um, knowing what you've posted and stuff that you would probably agree where you are a quote unquote you know, pro-choice advocate, and you think that, let's say, uh, a homosexual cu couple either should or can be married in the church, correct? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I what I would say regarding the specific question of, uh, of a gay couple getting married in the church, I don't think any church should be forced to marry uh, a couple that they don't feel comfortable marrying. They have that freedom of conscience to do, but I don't think a church should be forced not to either. So if, if a church right. accepted them, I'd be all for it. Um, but I, I think one thing I would say, just as a qualifier, is that even beyond that, um, well, maybe maybe I can ask I can ask you the question. So I am curious. Do you think that someone could have um, like I think I'm not I'm not a diehard Biden fan. Okay, so so don't quote me sure. on this, but I'm pretty sure that Biden might have said that like personally he's pro life, but 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 publicly he's pro choice as a matter of public policy. Is that possible? Oh, yeah, to, he may have said something that? like that. Because yeah. evangelicalism it depends on again that you're right. To, I, I, if your audience is confused about evangelicalism, we're all confused, including us evangelicals half the time. To be transparent with mm -hmm. you, but like I, I, for a long time before I was fully queer affirming, my position was: listen, I had this view about the Bible, but I also understand how my friend who is agnostic should be under no obligation to submit to my view of the Bible in his or her own life publicly. Like they still have a constitutional right afforded to them so i was able to kind of right. draw that distinction no problem is that possible for you or for others in the catholic tradition from your your perspective i 
I don't know. That's a good question. And the, the, the question that I wanted to ask you is it kind of, it kind of deals with that. Sure. So let's say you have, you have a, a, a gay couple who wants to get married in the church. And like you said, like, I don't think a, a church should be forced to uh, either do that wedding or not do that wedding. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it go um, just, and kind of like on a, on a, you know, um, what's the best way to put this? like a further view out view of the Bible, wouldn't that just necessarily go against scripture? Just, just inherently. Uh, because when we talk about like uh, in places like Matthew, where Jesus does talk about any sexual um, behavior outside of the context between a marriage of a man and woman is sinful. Would it then be a little bit, I don't even want to call it hypocritical, but then would it be a little bit ignorant for a church who claims to, you know, uh, espouse theology, espouse scripture, wouldn't that kind of go against what the church is? I understand that you want to be, let's say, um, accepting and loving, but does that require the marriage in a church? Yeah. Well, I think if the church holds to a certain ethic based on their interpretation of the Bible, they should be able to hold to that view. I don't think the Bible is really addressing what we think is homosexuality in any of those passages you're talking about. And I think you're talking about, talking about Matthew 18, where Jesus is specifically asked a question about divorce, not about marriage. And he answers it based on the question about divorce, for example. That's how I would look at it. Um, and then he like goes on Matthew, to say, it's Matthew 9. I can't and remember. And he goes on to say that that that, that eunuchs are, are pretty much the greatest in the kingdom. So there's a whole other discussion for us for a different time. Well, um, the, yeah, yeah, I mean, what, what I've... What I've said before is they, that that in the Bible necessarily it wasn't they didn't specifically name homosexuality. It's like there was a word I can't remember what it was in Greek. It starts Arcan, with an A. Arkinosotai. Yeah, maybe it talked about behavior and not necessarily yeah. about people, right? Yeah, like male better is the literal translation. Yes, male, male betters, or you know, for people to well, people some I've heard this. People say homosexuality didn't exist back then. It's like well, no, like let let let's let's be honest. for as long as humans have that's a kind of this thing that, i hate this wi-fi i hate it i'm i'm just i know nothing your, your wi-fi is great which is weird because i get a full signal here but um uh what were we talking about well you were just talking about uh, um essentially uh homosexuality in the bible people say it's not there but there's versions of it maybe that were happening in the ancient oh, world but the question that you asked me the question that you asked me earlier was oh, yeah. how would i approach would, would you say, how would I approach a homosexual couple who wanted to get married in the church or well, as no, a Catholic? I, how would that happen? No, I, I'm, I'm thinking about as a matter of public policy, right? Like for me, oh. even before I was fully queer affirming, um, which, you know, we, we, what I mean, what I mean by that is I thought the Bible condemned homosexuality, but I still was able to realize that, that we live among 300 million other Americans, many of mm -hmm. which do not hold to my view of the Bible or believe in the Bible the way I do. Do they have a right, right to be married in our society and to be recognized under the law publicly, um, you know, regardless of my of my theological views on this topic? Is that an option for you as a Catholic? No. OK, no, it's not I think I th and I think specifically because that the, the Bible, if, even if it doesn't talk specifically about the homosexual, it talks about the behavior and. I, I just, I, I, I have to, I have to agree just because when we talk about, let's say like the standard of what a relationship is, whether, and I think that standard is one man, one woman in order to be fruitful, in order to multiply, in order to have children and make a society where that is how you do it. And okay. That, that goes to say, like, I don't want to, I don't want to say that, you know, two gay guys can't love a child or something or can't adopt a child or something. Well, I don't think that they should adopt a child, but not saying that they can't love a child in the same manner. I think they can love children 100%. I just think it's different. I think that there are obvious differences between, let's say, a heterosexual couple and a homosexual couple. I just think that one, that one of those is the pinnacle and the other one isn't. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Now, I want to be clear. This is not a gotcha question. It's an honest question I'm really curious about. You know, yeah. there are, are tons of other passages in the Bible, like James 5, for example, where it says that if the rich exploit their own workers, that's a problem. So do you mm -hmm. also then advocate for the government enforcing, you know, laws around greed, laws around forgiving debt every seven years? You, you, that's actually, uh, that's a good know, question. Like, we, like, how do you, where's your hierarchy yeah. there of like, of like imperatives that society must abide by? Yeah. Speaking. 
Well, we, we, I mean, it doesn't even have to be biblically speaking. We can talk about capitalism. And I think capitalism has, it has become a system that has been too reliant and dependent on greed. And it's, it's kind of, you know, making people miserable. And I'm not saying, you know, do we all just give each other, you know, do, do, do we mandate by the government that everyone should be paid a minimum of $20 an hour or something like that? No, 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 no. I'm saying that I wish society, I wish that we were able to change the way that we saw the free market and incentive of just being this greed incentive where I have to make mm -hmm. the most money possible at the expense of whatever, that I think that needs to change. Yeah, I think, and to be transparent with you, I wrestle with this actually as well with like which a lot of my own morals come from, you know, some view of my Christian tradition. And I think where I've struggled in the past is like, okay, um, for example, you know, you were pretty clear, like, I don't think that my view theologically can be separated from what I think publicly policy wise. And so what I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. for you is like, I think the Bible is just as clear, if not more clear about, about, you know, the rich young ruler selling all his possessions to become a follower of Jesus. Or like I said, in James five, where it's an actual condemnation of essentially business owners who exploit their poor, like hello, Amazon. So right. are you fighting for laws then to minimize that sin as well? Like you would be for minimizing, I'm assuming the rights of queer people to be married because of your theological paradigm. Right, right. And I would, I would have to be consistent and I would probably have to say yes. It would just be mm. dependent on like what the law was and if it went too far if it, you right. know, it, and if right. it didn't. Right. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I mean, because because there, there there are things that I obviously like, like let's let's take abortion, for example. I'm, sure. I, I would be what you would call an abolitionist. I think I think abortion should be abolished. And I think not even having an in-depth knowledge of the Bible, because I am Catholic, but not even having like an <laughs> in-depth, like oh, I can just, you know, quote, you know, passage by passage. But I have, you know, I'm a little familiar with it. And Catholics do. We do read scripture at church. But um, if you just want to go off, you know, the basic tenets of Christianity, the basic tenets of, let's say, Judeo-Christianity, if you even wanted to say that, but are the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes on top of that. Like, obviously, thou shalt not kill. And I think that the unborn are probably the most vulnerable group of, of, of people, of humans uh, in the world today. And I think that, obviously, their lives uh, should be defended. And I, I think, and like you would think, that they probably have the right to life. If, if we have any rights in this country, they have to be preceded by the right to live, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. So something like that, I wouldn't even have to, you know, draw on the scientific arguments. And a lot of those scientific arguments were like, well, they are human beings uh, at the moment of conception. They are considered a unique human person with unique DNA. Um, I, I go past that and I say, listen, if anything, we're made in the image of God. Uh, we have the right to life. And um, and I think those those two things right there are the most important things. And I don't necessarily like have to have to draw on, you know, any other reason than that. Um, but let's, so, it's a yeah. good question when you talk about like you're probably going to ask like oh well how would you how do you feel about blasphemy laws is like is that something that you would want to like well I'm bring not going to existence I, you know I I think okay so I, the reason why I ask you this right because and it, I I gotta say Mike I'm really I really enjoy this dialogue I talk to people who I don't agree with all the time on my podcast so anytime I do this is, yeah. is always a win for me um I think what what. I think that the reason why a lot of people who grew up like me are are maybe now more progressive than where we were, either politically or theologically, is because we realized that like the movements that we were a part of were just inconsistent in in how they how they advocated for certain things. And so, for example, let's talk about maybe the abortion issue for a second. You know, mm -hmm. I get to a point, I got to a point where I, I got incredibly pragmatic. I'm like, I'm like okay. If abortion, let's just work in this framework for sake of argument, if abortion is murder and we want to stop as many abortions as possible, um, okay, we can outlaw, that's fine, but also some are going to get through. And we know that one of the biggest reasons abortions happen is because people, mainly um, you know, single um, parents or women, get pregnant and they're terrified because they can't afford to live in this country. They can't afford to have the baby. And also, why don't we advocate then for sexual education to stop people from getting pregnant unplanned it would solve so many problems that was my tradition i would say that and then the argument is well no god's view is abstinence well we can't we can't give them free food stamps that's socialism and i'm like okay so so even if you think this is murder you have limits to how pragmatic you will get right. to minimize abortion right. unless it's 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 outlawing all abortion which sometimes um, we don't have to call it an abortion, but sometimes women who are going through a miscarriage need medical help. And when the laws are really black and white, it gets real murky depending on, on how you yeah. look at stuff. So, so for me, I, I got to a point where I said, 
guys, if we're not going to care about the kid when they're one, two, three, four, five, if we're going to advocate for stripping uh, uh, school lunch programs away from people, which one person in Nebraska did as a Christian, I don't know if, if I'm in for just like, okay, we did it. It's no longer legal. Problem solved. No, there's still people behind these policies that I think as a society, we have to be helping. Right. And, my, and usually what happens here in the conversation is people will say, well, there are tons of charities. There are tons of, and I go, that's great. But charities don't solve all the problems because people still need to go through and be aware of that charity before they can get help. So there's always, especially in evangelical circles, there's usually strings attached for charity. Usually you have to go through yeah. their evangelicalism. You have to understand their political, whatever it is. And so for me, that's just not enough. Yeah. It's not solving the problem on a mass scale. So that's why I kind of move my position from the law thing to, you know, I think that ultimately... I, th I think I am pro-choice legally, but what can we do to minimize any need for abortion in society by promoting human flourishing? That's kind of where I land let's, now. Well, let's talk about capitalism. Let's talk about the system where, where the person would rather pay you to have an abortion just so he can get you back to work quicker. Right. Let's talk. Let's talk about that system. And let's talk about how ass backward that is, because women will women will say, you know, I can't afford I can't afford uh, I can't afford to have this child. Therefore, I'm just going to kill it. Oh, you know, this child, you know, my boyfriend is pretty abusive. Uh, I can't bring a child into this world. OK, let me just kill this child. But let's talk about these things fundamentally first. Why do we have. Why do we have businesses who would rather pay money for you to travel to a state where you can get an abortion, have that abortion, be at work the next day and not give a damn about your, your, your mental state of mind, your physical state of being? They just want to get you back to work. And a lot of women, I think, are that they're sold this idea that 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 and there's a little bit of feminism behind this. They're sold this idea where they want to be equal to men, especially in the workforce. So they're going to do whatever they can to compete with men. Well, do you know what's happening to you is that you <laughs> you're being you're being controlled by an even worse thing than let's say a quote unquote man is. You're being controlled by you know by by some Fortune 500 conglomerate who doesn't really give a shit about you. Let's talk about this other thing. Let's talk about how. There's probably somewhere between 30 to 40 to maybe even 50% of the, the reason why they have either boyfriends or husbands have talked to them. Like, what kind of guys are addressed? And the third thing was, yes, there are charities. Obviously, we know that there are charities. But... They're probably they're, the charities and the sexual education part of it. Yes, obviously, abstinence is the best way not to get pregnant. We know that. But we also have to realize we live in a fallen world and people aren't going to be abstinent. They're not going to do that, uh, um, you know, voluntarily, just, you know, like, like they're going to get a coffee in the morning. Like abstinence takes a lot, a lot of self-discipline. Um, so for, for, for the other 99.9% .9 of people out there, I think the education definitely has to be better. And then you'll have conservatives say, well, I don't want anyone teaching, you know, my kid, my five-year-old sex. Okay. I'm not saying that we should teach five-year-olds, you know, ab about sex really either. What I'm talking about is I think there comes a time, especially now, it was probably different 35 years ago when you and I were growing up. But I think there's a time now where kids probably do need to be taught about sexual responsibility, maybe a little bit earlier than than we were. And I think you'd probably solve a lot of these problems. Look, I mean, the, the average kid is exposed to pornography at age eight. OK, we live in a technology world. Phones are available. Parents do not do their do, 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 uh, due diligence to lock down their content. These are conversations mm -hmm. that I, listen. I'm not sure about you, Mike, but I'm I'm not looking forward to that conversation with my kid. But I know I have no, to I have daughter. it. I'm really right. No. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I have two boys and, and I'm not looking forward, but I know I have to have the conversation. Right. And I have to be someone who can tell them. You can tell me like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to scream at you. I'm not going to call you, you know, you're a loser. I, but just be honest with dad so I can help you navigate this because especially at a young age, pornography is, it is like heroin for the brain and it, it, it's mm -hmm. not good for young people. We, I think anyone, whether they're pro sex or not in that way, I uh, would agree that that children should not be being exposed to that kind of stuff. But just one thing, it's interesting, Mike, how you and I in so many ways are very different. Um, even with, with our terminology and like how we would identify politically, but with the capitalist thing, like I agree with you now, I, I would not say that, and I'm not sure, I'm not saying you're saying this, but I wouldn't blame necessarily feminism more than I would blame capitalism in a sense. And, be, and I'm here's why both probably equal, not equally, but I, I, there's a big blame to feminists 
uh, well, to the feminist I, movement. But I know, think my, under, my understanding is that feminism essentially just try to give women the option to live their life the same way a man would if they wanted to. Meaning, hey, you could stay home, or you can work in the home, or you can work in the, in the workforce and be treated equally. But besides all that, first we you yeah. know we, we can let that one go. You know, I think what's <laughs> frustrating to me is again, I'm just giving you my perspective growing up deeply entrenched in evangelical spaces. Sure. All yeah. this talk about pro family, pro family, we're pro family. And then we live in a society where, I mean, I live in New Jersey. It, you need two parents to make decent money just to afford to own a house or a, a, a afford health care. All of these things that people have been advocating for, you know, wages are stagnant. Wages are completely stagnant. If you look at for cost of inflation, they haven't moved in 40 years for the average working uh, working class family. If you're a BIPOC person, your average wage is $15 an hour right now in America. If you're a single parent, the average wage is $15 in America. If you start talking like that in my circles, you're automatically labeled socialist, Marxist, communist, you just want to, you want people on the nanny state government. All they got to do is work harder, get another job, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. It doesn't work. It's actually anti-family. When, 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 when mom and or dad is forced to go into the workforce because they have to feed their family, that's not feminism. That's not freedom. That is a form of, uh, of financial enslavement. And so yeah. I think you and I would agree a lot there because I would love a society, right? Where, where, where people are not paying a small mortgage to have their kids watched by strangers because they 100%. have to afford how to, how to pay the bills or how to pay for their groceries. So you yeah, and I think no, are I, aligned there completely. I, I agree. I agree. I was recently having a conversation with someone where they asked me, what do you think the American dream was? And I was saying, oh, that's a really interesting question. He's like, well, it's buying a house. And I said, yeah, that's really interesting now because you, you know, you look at, you look at the, um, you live at, post-war America in the 1950s and what was the American yes. dream? It was, it was buying your own house. It was having a car in you know the garage and it was sure. your wife stayed at home while you looked after the kids. And I think, I think we've been so caught up with consumerism. We've been so caught up with capitalism that that is, that is the, you know, the, the be all and end all of a successful person in America is like, how much money do you have? Do you own your house or not? What's wrong with renting? Oh, you'll always be a slave to whoever you're renting to, whatever. I don't see that. And like I've said before, and on the show we've talked about, it, I will do whatever I can to not have my wife work. She did. She worked up until about uh, two years ago when she was forcefully uh, resigned from her job from COVID. That's 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 another story. But <laughs> okay. she was even, she was, I mean, she had the same opinion, like let's say from the woman who would get paid for to have her abortion by 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 her boss or whatever. She was, she was even, under the impression, she said, I've been lied to. I, you know, my, my company does not give a shit about me. I am yes. replaceable. I yes. thought that, you know, these people would be, you know, uh, you know, something of a, I don't want to say like a home, but a work family who would have my back. Like, no, babe, you never replace it. You watched someone else raise your kid, not more than 10 feet away from you in your home office. Is that the ideal life? She said, no. So I even said, I will do whatever I have to do so that my wife doesn't have to work so that I can support this family. And listen, I've gotten by on 30 grand a year. I've gotten by on, uh, you know, on 40 grand a year. I'm not saying that everybody can do it. I've just been a little bit smart. I've been a little bit through. I've saved up before that. We've saved up before that. So not to say that nobody can do it. I understand the hardships of trying to raise, let's say three kids by a single mom, or let's say, you know, three kids by a two parent household is probably really tough these days, depending on where you live and what you do. But I'm saying it can be done. Are you willing to make sacrifices? But going back to that, it's it's this society has degraded so much, so much that you know, like I wonder what people in the 1950s would have seen if they would have seen similar problems. Not to say these problems didn't exist, but you know, you probably knew one person who you know had a baby by the time you know she was 16 and still in high school. Oh, do you hear about Jenny? Oh, yeah, Jenny got pregnant. But now it's like. You, you you can't you you know you can throw a pebble and hit anybody and know that this has happened to them. Well, I don't want to. I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I, I'm fairly sure. I'm sure someone will fact check me that teen pregnancies are actually lower than they like almost maybe ever been statistically speaking. Now we do have more people in the country. There's more people now than there right. was in the fifties. And I, right. I and I, I'm certainly not saying that you know um the 1950s were the golden era. I mean, we had segregation back then, so I'm not advocating for that. But you know, it's funny. My my grandparent, my my, my dad told me that. My my grandma and grandpa, they bought their house for like, I think it was $50,000 and they made about $20,000 a year, $25,000 yeah, a year. Yeah. So, so yeah. the house was, was only double what they make in a year. 
Well, right. you know, now, I, I mean, at least in New Jersey, houses are going for like 340, 400, 450. The oh, average I'm from Long salary, Island. I know all of it. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. So the, and so the average salary is like 75, maybe 80,000. That's like four or five times, right? So, mm-hmm. like, like, as time has went on, the even the ability to own your own shelter, to put it in a primitive aspect, is becoming less and less reasonable for most people. And then the renting market is exploding right now, and that's pushing prices up. Um, and a lot of like major corporations are buying up real estate yeah. to build, yeah. you know, rental properties on. So I, I I think you and I might have a different um solution to maybe some of these things. Um, sure. but I think that I think where there's overlap is that we see some of the same problems and we go, right. yeah, like there, there's a pro- it's not it's not sustainable for most humans in this country to live this way long term. Debt the average debt's through the roof. About a hundred million people are in medical debt in some form. Where are yeah. we heading? That's not good at all. I think I think you and I probably both see an ideal and the way to get there might be a little bit different. You know what I mean? Like b- between how the two of us think, um, but although there may be some similarities, um, and I, I I don't know what it is, man. I don't know if it's social media. I don't know if they're 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 puppet masters with puppet strings who you know who who are hurt. You know the dark nefarious forces within the government and within within business. I I, I don't know, but I know that there's an ideal, and I know that I would I would love to see. Um, you know, society rectified in a way. And I think one of those ways is I think more people have to come to Christ, to the Catholic church. And I think that's the way it is because I, ultimately with Protestantism, I just think that like everyone turns into his own little Pope, like his own little version of the Pope. Okay, this is how I interpret something. No one's going to really change my mind about this. Oh, wait, then there's this other guy who has this interpretation of it. Okay, where does he get his interpretation from? And then that just goes on ad nauseum. Whereas for oh, us, yeah, we've had okay, completely. 2,000 years of doctrine. Uh, Christ established our church. Now, obviously, there have been some popes who, who have had disagreements with other popes. And stuff like that. But I don't know. I just find that to be the, Let's move on well, to the next subject because uh, okay. how much time do you have? I probably got about 15 minutes left, um, po- uh, most likely, 15, 20 minutes. 15, 15 minutes. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Well, okay. We Okay. So here we did talk about this because there was a post that you made called um, Things You Don't Have to Believe uh, oh, yeah. Post. And number four was one way to vote. Like, do you believe there's one way to vote? And you said you can make political choices in alignment with your views and not fear political retribution. Um, and what I would, and I guess what we did talk about, cause my question to you would have been, how can a Christian vote for pro abortion candidates and stuff like that? And we did talk about that, yeah. um, which was, oh, here's a, here's something interesting that you said. And I don't know, I can't remember what post you got this from, but you said, uh, the term quote, anti-white racism, unquote, dilutes the meaning of racism. And I wanted you to explain what you meant by that. Uh, colorblindness or anti-white racism? A- anti-white racism. I said that I can't. Yeah. I can't remember what the context of the post was. Oh, I'm so um, sorry. I have no recollection of that. <laughs> if I no, did, I would gladly I, talk about it, but I don't. Okay. I can't remember which post. Maybe I'll send it to you later and be like, Oh, this is what we talked about. And you can clarify it on. Yeah. The sorry about that. Well, everyone. I, I have no here, You know what we can do? I wanted to touch on one thing before we got into questions from fans, but um, okay, cool. you did talk about uh Congressman Tim Burchett. Do you remember that? Yeah. The Tennessee, uh, that, the, the Tennessee, the Tennessee yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the guy Tennessee who's like, uh, we need revival in this country to fix the gun pro- the gun violence problem. Right. And what's what's interesting is is I made a video that I guess went somewhat viral, not 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 incredibly viral on Instagram. But the end of that clip, someone said to him, someone asked him, Well, hey, well, what would you do if your kids were in school? And he's like, Oh, my kids aren't in school. We homeschool our kids. Yeah. And I was like, That's that's boom number one. So I said, if you want to stop um mass school shootings, you can do so in three words. It's homeschool your kids. And the overwhelming majority of the people were supportive of that. And then there were a lot of people who were like, well, no, one, not everyone can homeschool their kids. And what we right. talked about before, I, I still think people can do it. I understand the hurdles that a lot of people will face, whether it's single moms who have to work the jobs, um, you know, and, and let's say lower income families who can't, who can't afford for one person to stay home. I get that. I totally get that. I think there are ways in which you have like homeschooling communities. Uh, you have uh, groups of families who can meet up and teach together in one household. Those are just a bunch of different ways. But I was being quite literal. If you homeschool your kids and if everybody homeschooled their kids in America, there could literally be no mass school shooting. So it was a little bit of a play on words as well. Mm-hmm. But I think that is one of the bigger, um, the bigger ways to stop that. And I see that that's a very just big logistical issue that people have to deal with. But uh, a lot of people 
uh, especially that follow us said the obvious thing, which is would be the obvious conservative response would just be to have, let's say more armed SROs or more armed teachers. And like, that's what I'm not, had. A fan of, I'm not a fan of arming just any random teacher. Um, just because like, am I willing to put my, my kids lives in the hands of like six year old Miss Karen, who, you know, has never shot a gun before in her life, but who wants to be, let's say armed yes. might have a better chance, but still I like, I'm not necessarily comfortable with that. Um, the one in Tennessee, the shooting that happened in Tennessee is just so sad just because like the, the hard line assets weren't in place. She shot through the fucking doors. Oh, sorry for using the F, F the F word, but she shot through the doors. Oh, like, that shouldn't happen. Fun, yeah. Like you, you should have bulletproof glass in schools. And even to think of like schools needing to have bulletproof glass is just another example of how this society has just completely deteriorated. Um, but, but you don't think like, okay, so a couple of things. I actually went to a rally advocating for gun control in Tennessee uh, two weeks ago. And one of the okay. big, uh, one of the mothers whose son attends Covenant, thankfully he was not harmed, spoke. Yeah. And she said that they had all that. Now they had security, they had trained teachers, some teachers were armed, and some of the doors were bulletproof. And it still killed six people. So I just, my question to those people, I'm not saying you, I'm not sure where you land on this. My question to these, to like the Teddy Cruz's of the world is, so, so, so what are you really saying? Like we need armed security around our schools 24 seven when it's recess, you want a SWAT team around them. Like how realistic is this before we start realizing that, you know, oh, people can go to the store and pick up an AR-15 legally. Maybe we should start there before we start thinking about all these other roundabout solutions to keep AR-15s in the hands of whoever wants them. I mean, to me, it makes, again, logically, it makes no sense when you really spell it out. There was a, there was a shooting scare at a beach two weeks ago. Should we now yeah. arm the lifeguards? Like, just take that logic all the way down to what wait, wait, you're advocating for. It makes it's, no sense. It, it's such, it's, I, I get it. It's such a deep, it's, it's such a deep issue and problem that the simple fix, the, the, the fix that would seem the simplest is actually probably the most complicated because then when if you just talk about okay eliminate the AR15s okay well what do you want to do do you want to just eliminate them totally who gets them are there still are they still available or whoever has AR15s gives them up as far as like government entities or uh, any sort of security or private security forces able to have them because you have to be consistent. If you're going to, let's say, take them away from, from the population, from the regular population, from the citizenry, then do you have to take them away from people who are guarding banks, who are guarding politicians, who are guarding the border? Like that's, you have to be consistent because if you say, well, no, I think, you know, politicians should still be okay. Then you're a hypocrite. Number two, what do you do about illegal gun sales and people who procure these things illegally? Now, I think the Covenant shooter probably bought these um, bought these guns legally. The problem that goes deeper within that is that her family and people around her were well aware that she had psychological issues, and not just not not just the whole trans thing. She had she had psychological issues that her parents were definitely aware of and didn't say anything to anybody. Does that go into red flag laws, which I'm not really a fan of? Probably, but again, the degradation of society where no one speaks up more when someone is having a clear either mental issue or mental break where they know that that person shouldn't be around weapons. To who, Third, To who? You're, you're advocating for calling the government on people, right? Isn't that like what well, big that, government well, that, people that, don't that, want? That's exactly what, that's, that's what I'm talking course, about, right? All government people don't want. Yeah. yeah that, well, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. It's like, who do you, who do you, um, who do you lay the responsibility in stopping these things? Do you, do you, do you, uh, do you lay that on the government who is, who now wants to take away people's uh, weapons, who then now can call for any excuse to do so well, um, I, and then target necessarily anyone they want. So you know, I, I don't want to, okay, let, let, let's talk about some data that we, that we all probably know. There's more guns than people in America. So we know the genies, the genie yeah. isn't going back in the, in the bottle anytime soon. Right? I, I, right. I'm not aware of anyone who's advocating for going house by house to compensate everyone's guns. Okay. Right. What, and what and the, because of the day and because of the data, we know that let's say they're probably close to maybe 500 million registered guns in America. And then probably double that almost unregistered. Right. So probably. when you talk about like the, the percentage of deaths in relation to how many guns in existence, I don't want to say that it's a non-stat, but it's incredibly, 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 incredibly low, given the amount of guns there are in this okay. country. Uh, even if that's the right. case, we're, we're still we're still off the charts for like other developed countries regarding our gun violence. Um, but mm. um, um, uh, oh God, where, where was I going with that? Um, oh, um, we also know that like, I think it's like three or 5% of the population own like a majority of like these guns. Okay, like statistically. Yeah. Um, and I also know that I think it's 65 75% of Americans are in favor of gun laws. Now that no one's again, let me be clear. 
No one's saying taking away people's guns, just gun laws. Like, you know, okay, before you buy a gun, maybe we should have a process that's standardized so we know that you're safe to own a gun with, stuff like that. So it, what, what, what frustrates me is that it seems like we're kind of being held hostage, no pun intended, by really the, the gun lobbying industry and the NRA, uh, who seems to want to have absolutely no at all, any kind of regulation for people to be able to buy a gun. I mean, I, Florida just passed permitless carrying. Is you you talk a lot about the the devolving of society? Don't you think a society where everyone's armed to the teeth only fuels that devolving process? I mean, I agree with you. I don't want my teachers. First off, teachers don't get paid enough to to carry guns. Teachers don't yeah, sign right. up to carry guns, and teachers right. should not be responsible for putting their life on the line for their kids because we live in an ultra violent society where there's more guns than people. So to me, I, 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 I think keep stuck on this. With, 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 with I don't, people I don't, who would say I'm pro life, but also, hey, more guns are fine with me. So I'm I'm not understanding the position. Help me. Right. Well. Well, just so you know, you're talking to someone who's not pro-life. He's an abolitionist. So let's just let's let's Fair. let's make that distinction very clear. Um, I, I think that the a lot of a, a lot of the 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 scary um, what would you call them? A lot of the the scary predictions that people will say. Well, if everybody's armed, wouldn't that just make it a kind of like a wild wild west society? They don't take into the account the numbers of crimes and the number of deaths that are. Um, that are prevented from people who have used guns and not necessarily have even fired them, but just in the presentation of them that have saved lives. Uh, I think per FBI statistics, it was something like anywhere between like uh, a million to like a million and a half lives are saved and crimes have been averted from people who were armed, who either presented or who were able to defend themselves. So I don't think that like people are going to be walking around like the wild, wild west if everybody's armed. I also don't think not everybody wants to be armed. Um, so that 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 kind of like scare tactic, like, well, if everybody's armed, it's going to be crazy. I don't really see that kind of happening because that's the case in, let's say, Switzerland, where uh, there's a gun in every household. Not everyone's necessarily walking around armed, but because they have um, Switzerland, you know, is a country that was never invaded in any war just because of their their love of firearms. And it's just there's a gun, literally a machine gun in every household because there's compelled military service and you're allowed to keep your weapon in your home for a certain number of years when you get out. That's besides the point. Um, but I think... <laughs> I think the NRA is a horrible uh, institution only because they are behind some of these gun laws because in order for them to make money and to continue to scare people into buying guns, they have to make you believe that there are people wanting to take your guns away. So the NRA is not a good organization. I don't buy into it whatsoever. Um, the one organization that if you do is the USCCA, which will actually help you legally if you get into problems or if you happen to have your own situation where you have to defend your life, they will actually provide you uh, legal advice and possibly a lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, not a fan of the NRA. And in buying guns, I have many guns. The, it's not it's not a very easy process, especially when you want to accessorize guns. Let's say if you want to um, if you want to change the length of a barrel, or if you want to put let's say a suppressor or a silencer at the end of your guns, you have to go through all these ridiculous ATF rules and ATF policies. There's tons of paperwork. There are even more background checks. And even the same, you file uh, the same form fours uh, when you go to um, purchase a weapon. And if it's like they always. An AR-15, to a lot of people, is a scary-looking gun. I think it's a cool-looking gun. I think it's sexy. But a lot of people find it to be scary when, in fact, the loudest cases have been shown to be used uh, people who have perpetrated crimes using AR-15s, but they are actually statistically the the minority of cases. Like, the majority of cases just yeah. happen to be used using handguns. Like, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. So Yeah, but but when, when it comes to mass shootings, AR-15 is a weapon of choice because it kills the right, most right, the quickest uh, amount of time. Right, it, Right. Well, except for the uh, Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech was done. I think that was like the most amount of deaths recent. Uh, maybe pole shooting. It's like pole shooting. I think Virginia Tech was somewhere around like thirty or forty. That was done with two handguns. Um, but then that 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 just gets into like a little word game that we're playing and like sure. that data that we're throwing around. Yeah, when right, right. the 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 issue is, it's like okay, what can be done to avert these types of things? Is it you know, um, is it the secure schools? Is it the is it doing even more in depth mental checks when people are buying guns? Like, what is it? Where was it before 1990 that these things weren't happening and even more guns existed in the country? Like, it, by by stat, I think based on the population, there were even more guns back then, 50 years ago, per capita than there is now. Hmm. Like, based on like population growth, hmm. like uh, mm -hmm. the numbers just look like, bigger. Like, 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 like the ratio, yeah. 
Right. But how come, you know, kids were able to go to high schools with, you know, the guns in the, in, in the racks and the trucks like that? How come high schools were able to have skeet shooting teams? A buddy of mine was a skeet shooter on his high school team. Like that was a team. He brought his rifle to school. You know, what changed where kids weren't able to have, you know, their shotguns in the lockers? They walked into school wearing the lockers. What happened? Degradation of society. Is that a society without Christ? Is it a society further away from Christ? Who defines even what Christ is teaching? You know what I mean? Because you and I, <laughs> Would would, would, <laughs> would would think obviously different about that. So yeah, for sure. Let, I, I think it just devolves back into you know how far away from Christianity or from Christ or from living a life like Christ are we truly moving away from? Um, yes. But then we get to the debate, want, I, the debate of, of of who's Christ. Yada yada yada. You know. So. Right, right, right. And I mean, like <laughs> this obvious this debate would just too many too many um, topics to tackle with you. But I want to get to a couple of questions just from. Um, our audience that wanted to ask you some questions. So did let me you enjoy this conversation up. with me, Mike? Did you have a good time? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like there are I people did. who are going to say, you didn't go hard enough on him on this. You didn't go hard enough on him on that. What I don't like to do is bring people on this show. Like I'm not a nighttime cable show. I'm not <laughs> yeah. in here. To make, I'm really not here to make people upset. There are certain people who, who, let's say on Instagram, I'll get into really emboldened Same. conversations with and yeah. like maybe more, more not malicious, but maybe not more charitable. A little more intense. You, when yeah. I saw you, I was like, there was something that just said, okay, this guy's a nice guy. We complete, we think completely different. And you remind me of actually, you remind me of a friend who's no longer a friend because <laughs> sadly, this is someone I worked with. This is someone who came to my wedding and I had only mm. 60 people at my wedding and he was one of these people there. And are you familiar with uh, that non-binary dude, woman with the chest hair and the long hair, that guy, a lock something? No. You know who this is? Mm -mm. I only know who it is because it shoved in my face, Tim. But <laughs> but uh, on social media, it was a guy who just basically, my friend shared a story where this guy said, I don't really understand how people are able to understand sports brackets, but they're not able to understand what a non-binary person is. Mm -hmm. And I said, my friend put that in a story and I, I DM my friend responding to it. And I was like, well, you know, people who are into college basketball are able to understand college basketball brackets. Why would you expect that same person to have a fully, you know, uh, understanding opinion of what a non-binary person is or even gender ideology? Like, they're just not going to know. Of course, they'd be ignorant to it. And right. then my friend was like, you're so insensitive. You're so ignorant. The guy's talking about empathy. You totally missed the point. And I'm like, no, well, he's relating two different things, like sports brackets and gender ideology. There are going to be two very different kinds of people who understand these things it was kind of like a bad comparison and then he, my my friend who at the time i worked with came to my wedding was like you espouse so much hatred i can't believe anyone listens to you don't dm me back or don't even text me back because we're not friends mm. anymore and i was like oh mm. yeah and i, I lost like, a friend seems as like, well for that i was like tim seems like someone who maybe agree with the other person but was willing to have a conversation about it where I'm just like, where do we go wrong where we can't even talk to our friends about this, let alone have better conversations with people on the internet who we've never spoken to before. Yeah. Um, and, and that's part of that degradation of society that I think is brought, hmm. brought you know, onto us by social media. Okay, let's get into some questions. I won't ask you a long question. This is from Franco Aurelio. He wants to know, why are you not Catholic? Because <laughs> I didn't grow up that way, know, Franco. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know, well, you can convert. There are plenty of catechumens out there. Um, yeah, are you open true. to follow Jesus wherever he takes you? Emphasis on where, wherever. I would not be where I was today if I didn't believe that. Let's put it that way. I, I lost my entire faith community over this journey. So yes, I would like mm. to say so. Um, you know, to be transparent with you, um, I think there's actually I'm actually quite curious about Catholicism because it's a tradition I never really was exp was brought into or really understood, right? And from the little I've I've experienced or I've heard, I'm like, wow, fascinating. And also, I think that especially Protestants, go get yourself a rosary, Tim. Oh man, go get yourself a rosary. Okay, Carry maybe I will. Wherever. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I do think that if I'm being, you know, as honest with myself and with the audience as possible, I think that I knew pretty early on. I'm like, you know, I'm I'm grateful for my Protestant heritage, but Catholics were here first. <laughs> like they have a longer tradition, and like maybe right. they have some wisdom that like people like me can really learn from. Um, yeah. you know, but as and the current, in the new world that we got here, we got here before the pilgrims ever did. Yeah, for sure. So. Yeah. 
Anyway, I, I'm, I'm definitely not hostile to, uh, to Catholicism, but at this point in my own faith journey, I'm not looking to become a fundamentalist all over again. Uh, I'm not saying anyone in Catholic faith is that way, but I'm not looking for right. a new room to plant in right now. I'm still kind of exploring all of them. I get that. Yeah, there, there, there are there, there are different types of Catholics out there. And what I found was when I entered the faith, I didn't want to be just this Catholic who went to who sinned freely during the week and then went to <laughs> went. To, church on sunday and thought you know that's it that's fine I, I i had a discussion with this woman i invited her to a theological panel and she says no my weekends are reserved for wine and then i i, I get with god on sunday i said that that's what do you why why even bother going then yeah, what's, what's the yeah. point um I but if that. you have any questions about catholicism i know a bunch of people who are who are smarter than me that can you know send you some good books and even just praying the rosary like there's something so dismissive about protestants who say you know it's 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 uh what do they call it? it's pagan it's yeah. it's not biblical it's ritual I mean, yeah yeah it's, i mean ritual's great there's there's rituals great there's structure that's yes. great and there's so much power in these beads and i'm not talking about like you know ooh, witchy woo woo power no there's the power of christ in these beads christ is represented on a cross at the end of this rosary he is the first person you acknowledge and he's the last person you acknowledge it's one of the one of my favorite lines there's a prayer at the end of the rosary where uh it says this is the prayer at the end of the rosary oh god by the life death and resurrection of thy only begotten son who hath purchased for us the rewards of eternal salvation grant we beseech thee that meditating upon these holy mysteries of the blessed virgin mary or the holy the, the holy rosary of the blessed Virgin of mary that we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through our same christ our lord amen and a lot of people will say well the rosary is just total devotion to mary which it is and based um and, and it totally obfuscates god and it's like no the whole point <laughs> the whole point of this rosary is god and is christ and i found my way back to christ through mary if that makes any sense because that is how christ came into this world through mary um, okay, so let's get on to the next question. Let's Fair. see. Uh, B Mac in eighty nine on the trans topic. Why is the topic of identity only to gender? Why not age and race? It's a broad question, but I, I've I've heard people say that trans racialism makes more sense than transgenderism. Have you heard this? No, this is the first time I ever heard of those two words put together like that. The argument is is that race is even is even on a bigger spectrum than let's say gender is. And this is this okay. is only from what, what I'm hearing. So let's say you come from like a mixed race uh, parents, your father's black, your mother's white. Where do you then fall on that spectrum, especially outwardly? Like where, where are you? Are you closer to white? Are you closer to black? Like that to a lot of people that makes more sense than saying, okay, well, if I'm a man, I, how can I be a woman? If I'm a man, like there only exists a binary. I can't see myself on this spectrum. So I don't know what he was asking. Let's see what he was asking again. On the trans topic, why is the topic of identity only? Oh, why do you think that the trans uh, ideology doesn't involve, let's say, transracialism or even transageism? I got to be honest. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't want to try and bullshit on expecting. that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Great question. Um, are you <laughs> here? I'm only going to bring on some negative comments because I feel like this is going to make you laugh. Great um, comment. It's from Jeff. Didn't know who this guy was. After watching, he's just full on apostate. <laughs> well, you know, all my Calvinist friends think the same thing, so it's cool. You guys can talk about me together. <laughs> Calvinists are weird, man. I can never get behind the Calvinism. Like there's a lot man. of there's a lot of like brain gymnastics going on there. I, I think something that the re one of the reasons why now I'm I'm so comfortable and used to like people calling me apostate is because. I just realized that like the Christian tradition is so massive and this is kind of how it's always been. Everyone's calling everyone an apostate. So I'm like, okay, that's yeah. fine. Like you're more than entitled to your views, but also like in the Christian tradition, I fit somewhere, even if you don't like it, it just is what it is, you know? So. Yeah, it is what it is. Um, this is from joyful Maryland. What is your jo joyful Moreland? What is Ooh. your process for consistent study of all of scripture and the faithful application of its teaching? So I guess just basically, how are you able to consistently study scripture? Yeah, well, I and again, I don't want to overspeak here, so please correct me. But you know, I'm pretty sure the Catholic Bible and Protestant Bible differ in terms of books, right? You have the mm -hmm. Apocrypha. Uh, so you know, in the Protestant tradition, they like to tell you that all you have to do is read the Bible, and it's kind of self-revealing. At this point, I'm much more into the scholarship. Um, you know, there are scholars that I just really love and listen to that have helped me 
I would argue maybe do my best to understand the Bible on its own terms before I just automatically impute mm -hmm. my own worldview on, on top of it. So that's kind of how I study it right now by listening to people who have spent their entire life uh, in these texts, um, you know, trying to just soak up like, okay, here's what's, here's what's going on. Here's some awareness when you're approaching the text. That's really helped me. Would you ever be open to reading like Aquinas or St. Augustine or any of these guys? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think it's important to read dead people. You know, I mean, we. I think <laughs> one of the mistakes that people who are more progressive can do, and I've seen this before, and I, it bothers me, is that they kind of think like, oh, those old heads back then were just idiots, you know, and that we have this new enlightened reality. And I think it's kind of both and where mm. there's a lot of wisdom in the church tradition that we can really learn from. At the same time, how do we apply wisdom to make wise decisions now while realizing that we are, you know, humanity is always moving somewhere, right? So I think it's yeah. more both and than, oh, whatever's here in front of us is like the new best thing. And whatever they said back there, you know, they've never experienced these problems today. No, I don't think that's the case. So yeah, I'm definitely down to read those folks. This is from JWS594. Why stay Christian as a progressive? Why not just fully embrace atheism? I mean, progressive Christian, I, oh, sheesh, uh, because Jesus, <laughs> something about liberating the oppressed in Luke, I'm no expert, you know, but like you just yeah. you read the Sermon on the Mount, read the words of Jesus, read, like I said earlier, James 5. I think that, that, and also in the evangelical tradition, there's a pretty decent progressive tradition that's been around for a couple hundred years. The early Wesleyans, for example, were abolitionists. Uh, they were staunch abolitionists. They were incredibly mm -hmm. pious, incredibly socially minded. They were egalitarian. They were the first people to ordain women in Oberlin College. So for me, there's definitely a tradition to kind of learn from as I keep thinking about these things. But to be I'm fair, not, I don't really use the term progressive a whole lot for me, not because I'm not progressive in my views. I just, right. you know, I it's a term that I don't really, I'm not like, yes, this is my people, progressive right. Christianity. I think it's too vague personally. Yeah, no, I get that. Here's a question I wanted to ask you because you lightly touched on this. When people who necessarily aren't Christian. This is always the same thing. I hate being, I hate being spoken to about Christianity from people who aren't Christians, atheists, all that stuff. So, Cause they'll say, well, you know, Jesus was a freer of the oppressors and he loved prostitutes and he loved people who, who were engaging in homosexual acts and all this kind of stuff. And I just wanted to be like, listen, he didn't welcome these people into his arms because he loved what they were doing. These were repentant people. Uh, let's say, uh, let's say prostitutes who didn't want to act the way that they did anymore. And they saw Christ as a savior, right? Like Christ isn't applauding someone's prostitution. You know, they're saying, yeah, keep that going. You keep on doing that. Christ wouldn't applaud a woman who came to him and asked, do you think I should get this abortion? You're Christ and love is love, right? You're going to tell me to have an abortion. Christ would be like, no, don't have an abortion. I love you. And I don't want you to kill, you know, your, your child. Like he wouldn't, he wouldn't be supporting these acts, right? I think he comes to people uh, especially in scripture, who were repentant of their behavior, right? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking about, is that every example? I mean, I, I, I know the common one is like, it's like the woman on the well, or at the well, you know, he says, go and sin no more. But did, did she repent? I think he just told her, go and sin no more. I don't think she said, yes, I repent of what I, whatever I was doing. No, but, um, not but even I, that, I don't but, know. I don't know. But like a repentant heart, you know what I mean? Like someone who knows what he or she did was wrong and who is at least willing to repent. Like a lot of these people would just say, yeah, you know, Jesus would forgive me about because, you know, because Jesus is all love. Like that's, just, you know, the whole love is love thing really confuses me because I don't think Christ, I don't think Christ loves us, loves us, like absolutely loves. I don't think Christ, let me simplify this. I don't think Christ loves everything that we do. I also don't want to say, I think Christ, they say Jesus wept, like Christ, I think weeps and suffers and he did suffer and die for all of our sins. He paid that debt. So I don't, I don't view Jesus as someone who is just clapping or applauding and all the mistakes that we make or in all of the horrible decisions we make. And when we hurt other people, I don't think Christ is applauding that. Sure. I think what he applauds is our recognition of what we did was wrong, our recognition of how we harm other people and he recognizes when we want to repent and give ourselves to him. I think that's I think, what he. Yeah. I, I think even if we use that, which I, I, let's say I agree with you, I think that's also why I'm maybe more progressive than when I used to be, you know, cause I think that I've realized that I've harmed people in ways that I didn't realize. And I want to repent of that, you know? So right. I think, I think repentance is a gift to make the wrongs that we've done uh, or that we've committed. Right. Which is, I, I mean, imagine if we couldn't imagine if anything wrong we did couldn't, couldn't be fixed. We'd be, yeah. really screwed as a, as a, as a people. So I think repentance yeah, no, I is agree. a gift. I just think for my tradition has been weaponized 
to like a few like surface level things of like, hey, repent from cursing and smoking and like don't have sex. But when it comes to like how we um, participate in systems that are oppressive to our neighbors, all of a sudden that's Marxism. I'm like, well, actually, maybe we can think about that as well. Like maybe this is a both and situation, not either or. Yeah, not a fan of Marxism, not a fan of capitalism. Also, why would I, if I'm not a fan of Marxism, why would I term coined by a Marxist? I'm, I'm just, I'm not falling for it anymore. That's what I'm doing. Um, Your base, this, man. this is from 1-800-JARBEAR, and we did talk about this. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> could you challenge his stance against Christian nationalism? There is no better force in American politics that is working to instill good morals and not just <laughs> my freedom. And I've actually like, okay. I have, I have, I have, I have come down hard against the first amendment. I am not, I am not a fan of the First Amendment in 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 a couple of ways. Only because this is this is in reference to oh man, I we I had a really like I can't remember what it was about, but um, I'm a fan of saying I don't want the First Amendment to protect the pedophile's speech in talking about how much he likes abusing children. I will not stand for that, and I think that sort of sp speech and rhetoric is disgusting and i think he should be in jail and then i got hit with back mike don't you want to don't you want to be made aware of who is the pedophile by allowing that freedom of speech no i don't i'd rather he be in prison and i'd rather he be probably strung up by the neck or even have a millstone uh tied to his leg and thrown into the sea so i like i found i found different cases in which like depictions of even pedophilia or just really graphic and brutal things in a sexual nature are supported by the First Amendment. Like, is porn supported by the First Amendment? Yeah. And if it's such a, 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 a net negative on our society, why do we allow it? Like, can't we come mm -hmm. to uh, like a consensus and say porn is bad, pedophilia is bad, anyone who talks about it, anyone who promotes it, anyone who glorifies it should not only be, you know, um, you know, prosecuted to the full extent of the law, but should be, you know, cast away from the society that we're trying to build. I suspect you disagree. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't disagree that pedophilia is bad and should be punished. <laughs> we can start with right. that. No, you know, no, like for the record, like, yeah, no, sure. yes, that, yes. I'm not in support. And I, You're I mean, not I, I, I don't want to speak as an expert. I'm not an expert here, but if, if someone bragged about sexually assaulting a child, I'm sure the police would look into that. Like, I think that there would be consequences right. for that kind of speech, you know? Um, yeah. Um, you know, the, the question was about why don't I advocate for Christian nationalism? Is that, is that, yeah, is that sorry, what I went off on a, yeah, I oh, went off good. on a little rant there. Yeah. American politics that is working. It's the, it's, there's no better force in American politics that is working to instill good morals and not just my freedoms. Okay. I mean, first off, good morals by whose standard. Okay. And which Christian nationalists are we talking about Stephen Wolf, who does want blasphemy laws in the country, who wants atheists right. in jail and who said that women should not be able to lead anywhere oh. in society. That's base, very base, different. Base. That's for, no, <laughs> no. I mean, this is the difference is that, listen, I'm not saying that people can't have religious convictions, but in a society that we live in, which is run by, regardless if you agree or not, a secular constitution, there's no mention of any yeah. deity in our constitution. Okay. Your right to swing a fist stops where my face begins. That's the bottom line. And we maybe, live in a, a pluralistic. Yeah, I know. I get I get what you're saying. I think a lot of people probably get confused about, you know, the, the, the Constitution and the founding fathers, because there is a lot of God on, let's say, printed money or in letters that the founding uh, fathers okay, wrote. But the printed or... money came in the 1950s, my friend, that, that the, the punch right. no, 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 added no. with God, 1950s. This is later developments. Yes. No, I get that. And not even like, listen, I'm going to be the first person to say the founding fathers weren't, quote unquote, Christians. I'm not going to say that a lot. A lot of them were just deists. Sure. We, we, we know, we know that for a fact, sure. though. I think, I mean, it sucks because you would assume that our constitution was based on the original constitution, the 10 commandments, right? Like they would, they would have to be like in, in, in for anyone to argue, it would just be a little bit disingenuous because, you know, we do have laws against murder. We do have, well, we, we don't necessarily have laws against, um, what is it? Coveting your neighbor's or wife or anything Sabbath. like that, but. Right or the Sabbath, but you know, not stealing. There's some good ones that we got out yeah, of that. Yeah, but but those. But just like to be said, clear, it, it's like you said, according to who? But but to be right? clear, those laws are not exclusive Christian ethics. Not stealing, right. not coveting your neighbor's wife. Those are not exclusive. The Trinity is an exclusive Christian ethic. Right. So, so, so the Christian nationalism insists that its particular view of Christian fundamentalism must be uh, uh, obeyed by the general public. That's why it's so, in my opinion, authoritarian in nature. Um, me mm. and, and, and a Buddhist could agree. 
that yes, we should not be stealing from our neighbor or coveting our wife, but we would not agree that Christ is Lord over all and is King, which is why we're not going right. to put it in our constitution like Doug Wilson wants to. So there's an, there's mm. a, a big difference, distinction for me between what can we as a society advocate for that seeks the good of all of our neighbors versus Christian nationalism, which seeks to keep particular Christian people in power over their neighbors. Also, last thing I'll say about this is that Christian yeah. nationalism wants to become the empire. I believe Jesus teaches us to subvert empire. There's a very big difference here. So I, I, I strongly oppose the Christian nationalist intent to take over and rule from the top down. Next time you come on the show, maybe I'll have a Christian nationalist on who can explain it better than I can, or I'm sure people in the comments will be able to explain it a little bit better. But when you look at, do you think it's just it's just a lot harder to do that in a country like America. What do you mean? Just based on just based on how diverse it is. When you take, let's say, a country like Hungary, who <laughs> Victor who Orban is really careful about, who, uh -huh. right? Well, let's just say who's who's had its who's who's homogeneous, who had had its traditions for let's say like a thousand a thousand years or so. They they they're all pretty much on the same boat as far as as far as religion, um, and they've just had um, uh, the same sort of worldview for a very long time, as opposed to America. It's a very young country. It's made up of a very diverse group of people. Right. Religiously, uh, 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 um, what's the word? Uh, eth eth ethnically, yeah, ethnically, yeah. religiously. Yeah. Sure. It's just probably tough. It, it, it's like a pipe dream to envision America as a Christian nationalist country. Uh, totally. I mean, again, I go back to our Constitution. The, literally, the First Amendment is very clear that Congress should not make any, uh, you know, whatever law, either prohibiting or endorsing, essentially, a, a religion. Uh, and yeah. so that has I know that, that this might shock some of your audience, but secularism is a good thing for Christians, too, because it protects your rights. And it makes sure that it makes sure that Buddhists or Muslims can't overwrite your religious freedom with their religious freedom. But it's a two-way street. And in the evangelicalism I inherited, there's definitely a supremacy complex of, no, 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 we have an absolute truth that no one else has, not even the Catholics. Sorry, Mike. And therefore, mm. God has given us a decree to rule over the country and to bring God back to America. And the reason why society is quote unquote devolving, I would debate that, but the reason why it is, is because we've taken God out of the schools and out of the, out of the courthouses and yada, yada, yada. And so God has taken his hand off of our country and we have to, we have to instill God back into America, which really means predominantly white Christian men need to be in power. That's what it translates to because God is not, uh, he's, you know, he's not a person. Right. He is right. he is a, a deity. He's he's essence. He's being whatever. He's not a person. So who rules on behalf of God in the Christian nationalist worldview? It's mostly white men. Unless you assimilate into that particular worldview, then it doesn't matter if you're a woman or if you're black. It doesn't matter. You're good to go. But you have to assimilate into that perspective. That is not that is the opposite of what America is built on. That is the opposite of what it makes our country our country. And I think ultimately it harms a lot of people um, more than it helps. Do you think that um, do you think that subjective morality is probably one of the more underlying harmful ways to think when it comes to, let's say, you know, our even our morals or our laws? I'm saying that where instead of holding to a, a a pinnacle of morality, which is Christ, you know, or I'm I'm just gonna say Christ. I'm not even gonna say the Bible. Pinnacle of morality, which is Christ. A lot of people who will say they're subject, they're, 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 they practice moral subjectivity. Does that tend to fall apart after a while? Like, does that tend to tend to not be able to live out if 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 you are not a Christian? And I'm saying this like, well, if if I say that, it, it, basically the the uh, the saying is, what would separate someone from being Hitler or Mother Teresa? You know what I mean? If you're a subjective moralist, what's the difference? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think lying is right or wrong? Oh, that's a, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, uh, do you lie? Do you lie to save the lives of people that are hiding in your attic from the SS? Exactly. That's, that that that's a question that I recently heard answered because you have. He said that you have a duty to save lives more than you have a duty to tell the truth. Oh, yeah, I, I think that that that's a response that Frank Turek uh, said. He's a he's a evangelical apologist. And I would agree. By the way, he's the guy that's always on stage. 
Yeah. And yeah, is Frank Turek. Is he the guy who answered that question with like a I little bit is. of the neck? Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. See, I I know these people, right? Um, but <laughs> I, I I I here's what I say. Again, we live. Our society is so binary, black or white. Is it this or is it that? And I think like this is where wisdom. OK, <laughs> is, is a long lost art and and things are not always subjective or objective, especially in terms of, of morality. I mean, we can look one example of this. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe we, we would disagree, but I'll put it this way. In the evangelical tradition, um, uh, an example I use a lot is I'll say, listen, um, you believe in sex before marriage is sinful, right? Yes. Is that objective? Yes. OK. You know, Martin sure. Luther also said that contraception. Uh, that uh, is sinful and that you are worse than someone who practiced incest. If you practice contraception, Ooh. do you practice contraception? Usually yeah. they say yes. It's like, okay, well, so, so are you being subjective or is Martin Luther objective? Like, which one is it? Which one is it? And so I think we have to be honest and realize that regardless of how it sounds, culture does have a massive influence on how anyone in that culture views moral, ethical, conundrums right. you know the catholic church condemned usury for right. a long time and then john calvin comes along and goes well mm -hmm. you know maybe it's not as bad as we thought and all of a sudden we live in this capitalist society where no christian i'm aware of even catholics think twice about participating in a corrupt financial system that exploits the poor for high interest rates right so yeah. are we just are we just off the truth or do, do things change i'm not saying i have an answer to that i'm just trying to make the point that like it's hardly as black and white as people make it seem frankly. And all you have to do is look through church history in any tradition and see how any tradition has shifted on certain things, give or take. Me, and I, I don't know here, I'm not the expert. I think maybe the least would be Catholicism. I think you guys have been pretty consistent since the beginning. Right. But and in evangelicalism, I, no. we're all over the place, yeah. man. No, 100%. <laughs> um, and again, I'm no Catholic expert. So there are people out there who are, who, who, are, who are a lot smarter than me, who I'm sure will be in the comments of this video. Last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, this, is from, yeah. uh, this is from a future guest who's coming on the show, Catholic uh, Catholic Caritas, does do you think birth control support by the Protestant churches was a good thing? Uh, I mean, ultimately, yes. I mean, especially if we're looking at this through the lens of, of and, and I'm for sake of argument, I'm agreeing with you that if if we would agree that abortion is murder, any chance mm -hmm. to prevent unplanned pregnancy that would, in theory, save a life, I think is is a win for me. I I'm under the impression that Catholics see that very differently. Uh, Correct. That's not my wheelhouse, but I would think pragmatically. Whatever we can do to reduce abortions, I'm in for it. As far as if, if we're using your line of you know logic there, I like that. I like that. I think I think you've got a little ways to go, but you're almost there. <laughs> well, think, well, Tim, Mike, I appreciate you, but you know, knowing that you had Nick Fuentes on the show, now I'm a little spooked. So we'll talk about that later well, on. No, no. Here's here's the thing, Tim, and I and I and I say this really, really, really seriously. And I say I say this really seriously. Anyone who has had opposing viewpoints or opposing opinions on culture or on politics who has talked with Nick in person, let's say on a show or something like that, those episodes, those shows are always so good because you realize the myth and the lies about him is that he's not this like Nazi white supremacist that the mainstream media makes him out to be. Like you, you guys might find that you might actually agree with things. You'll find that he's very smart and he can explain his position really, really, really well. And that he will... I don't think that, especially in person, he won't stoop to this level of just trying to own you, just trying to be mean to you for whatever reason, because he does have really, really interesting things. And especially like if, if you wanted to talk to him, let's say on, you know, a topic like the, the, the Russo Ukrainian war be really, really interesting to talk about. Cause he can go off on like a 15 minute tangent talking about, you know, th this specific year in Russian Ukrainian history, or if you wanted, if you wanted to talk to him about he's, he has the same opinion. I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Umar Johnson, but Dr. Umar Johnson is um, very well known in the black community for saying, I think black people should date and marry other black people to continue having other black people. And Dr. Umar Johnson was saying, you know, I would want my son to look like me. Nick Fuentes, on the other hand, he said the same exact thing, but he used white, white people. He's like, yeah, you know, I probably think that, you know, that white people should marry each other and have kids with each other. Me personally, I want my kid to look like me. So I would probably marry a white woman and have kids with a white woman. And then, you know, that whole thing gets blown up out of proportion because he's Nick Fuentes. But when you have someone like Dr. Umar Johnson, who just basically said the same thing, but on the other side, it's very, very interesting. And I'm not saying, hey, hit up Nick Fuentes and have a talk with him right now, like after this. I'm not saying that, but I think you'd be, I think you'd be very um, hard pressed not to find a fruitful discussion 
in with somewhere someone like Nick. And I'm just defending him because he's a buddy. But also because I, that's that's how I've seen conversations um, that he's had with other people who have disagreed with him. Well, I'll let you have that last word since it's, since it's your show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, listen, thank, thank you, Tim. Where can people find you if they've stayed watching this for almost two hours? Where can they find you? <laughs> My wife just texted me, how long is this interview? I'm like, I know, we've been going for a bit. Um, I know, anywhere, same, sorry. anywhere that the new evangelicals are is fine. I'm most active at Instagram. I will say I'm very open to good faith dialogue. If you want to come into my DMs and scream at me, you're more than welcome to, but I'll probably just say thanks, dude, thumbs up and be on your way. But if you have honest questions, I'm happy to answer them. And we don't have to agree. I'm totally fine with that. I'm not trying to proselytize you to, to, to see it my way. Um, the world's big enough for, for us to exist. So Definitely. Well, thank you, Tim. We really appreciate it. And for all you guys out there who are watching a new show every Wednesday, that's going to be the new thing that's going to happen. I'm going to try my hardest to make sure that that does happen. Thank you guys for coming, and we'll see you again next week.